the Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability is now in session. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is uh, the fourth day of the uh, fourth hearing day of uh, Public Hearing 27, in which we are examining uh, conditions in detention in the criminal justice system for people with uh, disability. I shall ask uh, Commissioner Mason to make the acknowledgement of country today. Thank you, Chair. Kaya, we acknowledge the Wajak Noongar people as the original inhabitants and traditional owners of the lands on which we gather today, Wajak is where the city of Perth is situated. We acknowledge their ongoing spiritual and cultural connection to Wajak Budja. We acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, where the city of Sydney is now located. And we acknowledge Megan, Brisbane. We recognise the country north and south of the Brisbane River as the home of both the Turrbal and Jagera Nations. We acknowledge and pay our deep respect to elders past and present. We extend that respect to all First Nations people and acknowledge their continuing connection to land, sky, seas and waterways. Finally, we pay our deep respect to First Nations people here today and who are following this public hearing online on the mainland and on the islands, including the Torres Strait especially elders, parents, young people, and Koolingars with disability. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Mason. Uh, Ms Wright. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Commissioners, our first uh, witness today is Megan Donohoe of the North Australian Aboriginal Justice Agency. And uh, Ms Donohoe is on screen and she will give evidence about her experience as a lawyer uh, supporting First Nations people with disability in adult prisons in the Northern Territory. Uh, we'll then hear from uh, a panel of three senior members of staff from the Aboriginal Legal Service of Western Australia. Ms Donohoe's statement uh, signed the 9th of September 2022 is found at Tender Bundle B, tab 54. And I understand she has already made an affirmation. Ms Donohue, thank you very much for uh, your statement, uh, which we have and which we have read. And thank you also for coming to the Royal Commission to give uh, evidence today. We very much appreciate your assistance. Um, just to let you know where everybody is, uh, we have in the Perth hearing room, uh, Commissioner Mason and Commissioner McEwen. Uh, Ms Wright is in the Sydney hearing room as am I, so uh, both of us will be participating remotely. Uh, and I will now ask Ms Wright if uh, for any questions she has of you. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Mason today is actually in Brisbane. I'd forgotten that. And uh, so Commissioner McEwen is our lone Commissioner representative in Perth holding up the fort. Yes, Ms Wright. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Ms Donohoe, could you please state your full name? Uh, Megan Louise Donahue. Are you a solicitor in the criminal law practice of NAJA based in Darwin? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, do you specialise in mental health law? Uh, yes, I do. Are you also a qualified social worker? Uh, yes, I am. For about 20 years before becoming a lawyer, you worked in the children, youth and family sector in the Northern Territory in various roles, including as social worker? Yes, I did. In your role as social worker, you worked with children and families uh, living with disability in forensic settings? Uh, yes, I did. Um, and that included in youth detention centres in the Northern Territory? Yes, that's right including Don Dale Youth Detention Centre? Yes. Um, now, in your role with NAJA, do you provide legal services to clients with a range of 
uh, disabilities, including clients who are deaf or have hearing loss, uh, clients with intellectual disabilities and psychosocial disabilities and other disabilities? Uh, yes, I do. Um, you've said in your statement that your clients almost always have complex trauma histories. Yes, that's right. And do many of them um, have English as a second or third language? Yes, pretty much all of my clients have English as a second or third language. What interpreting services do you require to be able to assist clients? Uh, we do requests to the Aboriginal Interpreter Service here in the Northern Territory. Uh, we have probably 12 main languages and there's in multiple dialects within those languages that we would request an interpreter for to assist with communication. Do you also require interpreters for your hearing impaired clients? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, that can be more complicated uh, if the, the method of interpretation is not Auslan. We have clients that have a culturally based uh, developed um, sign language that may be specific to their family or their community. Um, you've said that a frequent issue in your practice is the difficulties accessing interpreters and communication support? Yes, that's right. There's significant difficulties with that, with all clients. Um, you've given an example at paragraph 25 of a current client, JB, who is in custody. Yes. Uh, is he a 20-year-old man from a remote uh, community? Yes, he is. And he has a cognitive impairment? Yes, he does. And requires an interpreter? Yes, he does. Oh, what's the current system for finding an interpreter for someone like JB? And how quickly can you, as a solicitor, obtain an interpreting service? So there's an administrative process of completing a, a request form for an interpreter. Uh, once we complete all the information, they need to know the language. Uh, we also need to provide information about their family group and uh, their alleged offending. When that goes off, they'll assess that and try and source an interpreter within the time frame that we request. If we need one on the day, we can we follow that up with a phone call to see what the likelihood of the availability would be for an interpreter. And sometimes we can get a very quick response as if, there, if, if there's going to be a time uh, required if it's not available on the day. There's probably, depending on the language group and depending on what's happening in the area of where the language group is from. Uh, Can you just slow down slightly for the Auslan interpreters? Oh, my apologies. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> This is, this is a frequent issue we have, uh, Ms. Yes. Donahue. You're not, you're not the first, but we would appreciate it if you could go That's just a little right. more. Yes. Uh, so depending on uh, what, what's happening at a community, if there's sorry business at a community, that can also affect the availability of interpreters or any kind of other community unrest uh, that can affect the, the availability of interpreters. So... Once we've sent that form off and we get a response from the AIS, uh, we get a confirmation by email. There's a number to call and uh, a confirmation number and they connect us with an interpreter, usually on to their mobile phone, wherever they are on their community. And you've said that there are frequently delays in your ability to obtain an interpreter? Yes, there is. Um, what are the consequences when you cannot find an interpreter in a timely manner for a client? Well, I mean, first of all, it's very difficult to get instructions from our client and that delays progressing a matter. So it can be that you have multiple adjournments and the client, if they're in custody in particular, will continually uh, have to appear via AVL from the prison to court and they can wait around uh, at the at Holtz Darwin Correctional Centre for hours 
uh, not knowing what's really happening because we haven't been able to speak to them and have meaningful communication. And then if there's no interpreter available, it will be adjourned and it will be, I'll try to speak to them on the phone and let them know what's happening as best I can. But there's, it's always difficult to really know if they're comprehending what's happening. Um, once we have had an interpreter and we have been able to get instructions, in terms of progressing the matter, depending on whether we're contesting it or it's going to proceed by way of a plea, uh, we really require the, the services of an interpreter for that plea so that when the judge imposes a sentence, uh, they understand that sentence and so that can delay that part of the proceedings as well, which they can end up being quite prejudiced if they are looking at serving more time than they would otherwise be sentenced. Um, how does that prejudice arise? Because, for example, if we have a client that may be sentenced to six months custody, if the, the process of getting to the point of finalising their matter by way of a plea, by example, if it takes more than six months, then they're, they're basically doing more time than they would otherwise be sentenced. So they're being prejudiced. Mm -hmm. in, terms doing of, time. in terms of clients who may have a disability, um, do the delays in uh, locating an appropriate interpreter have any other consequences? I think the, the process that I've described becomes even more complicated if the client has a disability. It takes longer to get instructions. It can take longer to uh, communicate the procedural aspects of what's happening at court so that clients fully understand what's happening. And often there is differences with attention span and uh, there might be other questions and other areas of interest uh, that we may need to discuss for purposes of rapport building. It, it just can take even longer. Uh, so often we try to book several sessions with an interpreter before we can get to the point of proceeding uh, with the matter at court. Mm -hmm. um, are there any improvements that you think could be made to improve access to interpreters for Aboriginal clients in the criminal justice system in the Northern Territory? I can only speak from what interpreters have specifically said to me over the years. It, it is a casual workforce. And so how it works is that uh, interpreters are booked on a need basis uh, quite an ad hoc basis. So they may have a couple of bookings in one day, then no bookings the following day, and then another booking another day. So it's quite, uh, and a timesheet is completed. And so it, it is a casual workforce in that sense. Uh, there has been some suggestion, and look, I, I am inclined to agree that it would be great to have a, a full-time workforce or have the option for some interpreters to work full time uh, and even be based at court and be available all the time or on a permanent part time basis. Uh, that I think that would potentially increase the availability of interpreters. That would obviously require the, 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 the framework, employment framework, to support them to be full time with professional development and support, which should be afforded anyway as a casual workforce. Uh, However, and I think it would also, I am aware that some interpreters with the casual nature of their work, it's quite difficult managing Centrelink payments and being able to report different incomes, different weeks. So I think just having some flexibility for those that would like to work full time. Um, but potentially the interpreters that are working in other areas, in other jobs that aren't perhaps usually utilising their skills could come back and work full time as an interpreter. In terms of identifying whether your own client has a disability, what, what information do you generally have available to you to identify, A, the disability and B, uh, the severity of it? 
or the nature and severity of it? So when we first have contact with our clients, particularly uh, on a duty basis at court, from the very beginning of our interaction with clients, we will be making observations in relation to um, their ability to communicate, their ability to hear uh, other, um, other, I mean, for me as a social worker with my background, I make a lot of observations around an individual's presentation. There's also, um, we have prompts on our duty sheet around health questions and whether they're on a disability support pension, which are good prompts to ask further questions around what's happening. It's surprising how many clients are on a disability pension and do not know why. And when we ask further questions about that, um, it's sometimes quite difficult to ascertain why. And so that gives us a whole nother line of inquiry to get medical records and, and perhaps get that information from Centrelink, which is not an easy process uh, to try and find out why. Uh, obviously, it's quite a high standard to get a disability pension. So there's been some assessment along the way that's uh, where our clients have been approved for that. And that would be very, it's very relevant information for them while they're in the justice system and particularly if they need additional supports in custody. So um, am I talking too fast again? <laughs> um, you've, you've made some comments in your statement about the way prison authorities screen or assess new prisoners for disabilities. Um, what is your understanding of the screening and assessment for disability undertaken when an adult enters custody in the Northern so, Territory? So my understanding from talking with correction staff and health staff at the prison and my clients is that there is a general medical assessment uh, upon entry. And if there's particular issues that arise at that point, there may be um, referrals for, for other services However, it's, it's usually the case where it's a baseline medical assessment. And a lot of our clients' uh, disabilities can appear in a short interaction to be quite invisible. So they do get missed um, in the system. And it's often prompts from other services external to the prison to bring them to the attention of services and try and get some supports in place. Um, and you've said at paragraph 16, it relies largely on uh, clients self-identifying that they have a disability. Yes. Um, and uh, as you've said, clients sometimes don't know, don't know why they're on the disability support pension. Um, you have said that the screening's inadequate to identify disability. Um, you're basing that on your own observations and your own experience of yes. particular clients. Yes, I am. Um, now, in terms of uh, clients where a disability is known or it is identified uh, by the correctional uh, staff, what sort of plans are put in place for support for your clients, to your knowledge? So the clients that we have that are very high need will often end up in the complex behaviour unit. Um, that's a specialised section of the prison. I understand it has the capacity, 10 to 15 clients can stay there and they have a specialised um, support service, medical psychiatric service there. and. We have a huge proportion of clients that would also be considered to have quite high needs that don't meet that threshold because that, that service is, is resourced only for a certain number. So they can get lost in the general prison population. Each sector has a prison support officer and uh, we can utilise that person um, to try to you know, get updates as to how they're going, uh, try and make, we, we do make visits and go and see them. But in terms of getting external services such as NDIS and getting assessments done, it's extremely problematic um, for those particular clients. So, and it can be difficult to find out 
how they're really doing. Um, their self-report, if I'm able to speak to them on the phone, and many I'm not, um, the self-report from some clients probably isn't particularly accurate as to how they're really doing because what, what is considered their normal um, can be pretty terrible and quite an isolating experience. For clients who do meet the threshold to be housed in the complex care unit, um, do they normally find a place in that unit? Yeah, there's a, uh, there's a priority uh, process that I understand is managed by that particular team. And I'm sure from, I find dealing with that team really great. Like they, they refer to the clients in there as residents. It's a very different service um, than the main population of the prison. I'm sure that they would like to have more clients in there if they could. And however, I'm, I, I am aware of some that I would consider would meet that for sure and they're not in there. Um, I think we just lost your last words, Ms Donohoe. I would consider... The last, okay, I'll repeat the last. Uh, that I'm aware of... I have clients that have previously been in CBU that are currently not in CBU that, in my opinion, would be better supported there. And that's due to the resourcing. Um, <clears throat> you referred to the difficulty arranging NDIS assessments. Um, what are you in a position to do to seek supports for uh, your Aboriginal clients with disability in custody as a practical matter? As a, as a practical matter, uh, it, it is, we, we have a very uh, busy legal practice and, and providing this, this type of assistance is quite difficult. However, I, we have endeavoured to do it where we can. Uh, by way of an example, uh, to get a client on NDIS that's in the prison at the moment that has a disability, uh, I would book a professional visit and then book an interpreter. When you go to the prison and you're placed in the professional room for the visit with the client, you then need to get the prison officer to get the interpreter on the phone and transfer it to the room that you are in. So you have to make sure you have a room that has a working phone. There can be issues with the interpreter being available at that particular time and there's a very short time frame, perhaps 45 minutes, uh, to be able to, to get the interpreter on the phone. Then I have to make another call to NDIS to do the access request. So I've got the NDIS on the phone, the interpreter on the phone and the client uh, whose English is not a first language and also has a disability in the room with me. And we have to try and do that access request in that particular time. They also need to have um, a diagnosis and ID. So if without a diagnosis and without the ID, we can't even get to that point. And a lot of clients don't have a a proper diagnosis to be able to get to that point to even start that. Once we start that, that it, there's a whole lot of other barriers after that point. Often we don't get through the access request in that amount of time. So we have to rebook to continue it at another time. And it's just a continual juggle. And the client often has quite, they don't really understand what the NDIS is and how it's going to help them. And part of that assistance is uh, that you're, aiming to ensure that there are supports available to the person post-release from prison? Yes, yeah, so what we know is that clients who have better psychosocial supports are less likely to come into the justice system. So if we can do anything within uh, our resources at NAJA to ensure that they don't come back into the justice system, we will endeavour to do that. And getting we, we work with a lot of clients that have uh, very high funded NDIS plans and they do tend to do better uh, if they have supported accommodation and care teams and coordination for therapeutic supports uh, than if they were in custody. Are there any changes that you think could realistically be made to assist you in the task of that pre-release planning? There is uh, through care programs, 
that are available through the prison support services, uh, they, they're quite restrictive in their criteria and they're quite limited as to the amount of, of uh, clients that they can support. So uh, I could see it's expanding those services to have more resources to be able to provide a greater service, particularly for the clients who are on remand. Uh, it can take several months to get sentenced. And also just having more flexibility to be able to access the prison to do these uh, access requests for NDIS. But prior to that, uh, some support case management and some support to get ID and to be, get a proper diagnosis for those that uh, often we're acting on, a, on an imputed diagnosis or a suspected diagnosis because the disability is so obvious and yet they haven't been able to access a proper assessment to get a proper diagnosis. And where would that support come from? For, to get a diagnosis? Yes. Uh, I can talk to how it come, where it comes from now or where I would like it, where I could see. Well, is it coming from the prison authority or is it coming from the Department of Health? So to get, uh, for example, for clients that have an, a cognitive, uh, suspected cognitive issue, we really need to get a neuropsych assessment. And to have a neuropsych assessment, uh, you need a referral for that. Uh, I haven't, I'm not aware of an easy process to do that through the medical service at the prison. There's a lengthy wait and a lot of difficulties with accessing a neuropsych. If we are aware that someone has a cognitive issue and they are facing a significant period of time in custody, we'll use the Sentencing Act to request the neuropsych prior to being sentenced. And uh, there's also requirements for that neuropsych will often need an interpreter and the, the psychometric tools that are used for the assessment need to be culturally validated for use on Indigenous people. So we need to have uh, neuropsychs that have that background and understanding so that the assessment is accurate and meaningful and then it can be used uh, once, once there is a diagnosis, then we can use that to get a client on NDIS. So it can be quite a process. If you do obtain a report in the sentencing context that's helpful, is it available to, to, for use other than the court context? Yes, yeah, so we seek permission from the court for it to be released. And uh, with the consent of the client, uh, we can uh, try and get a support service to facilitate the NDIS request or do it ourselves. Often it does happen where that client will be released with that diagnosis and we won't have had any time or the resources to get a post-release plan in place. And it's often the case that they'll come back into custody and then we'll have another go with that, diagno that diagnostic report. Um, you've set out some recommendations at paragraph 31. One of your suggestions is that there should be a culturally appropriate disability services unit within correctional centres uh, to case manage and support people with disability yes. uh, in prison. Um, to your knowledge, is there any administrative unit or agency within corrective services uh, that coordinates issues associated with people with disability in prisons in the Northern Territory? So I have a lot to do with the forensic mental health team and I do find them an excellent team. It's just quite a small group of allied health professionals that do the case management and it's usually for the higher need uh, clients. So uh, there is, and there is the prison support team that have the through care, uh, they have some through care staff at the prison and then there's two externally funded programs uh, Naja being one of them. However, there, as I stated earlier, there's criteria that can be quite restrictive for clients to access uh, support through those programs. So I would be, it would go a long way for clients to have just a, an expanded case management service, building on what's already working there and adding in the, the cultural elements that are required and the, the cultural expertise as long as, as well as the allied health professionals.
and uh, facil assisting with facilitating access to NDIS and the pre-planning uh, steps that you've talked about? Yeah, so, it's, I mean, there's a lot that is usually required, but just the getting the baseline assessments done, finding out what the disability is, and then working with the client to do a plan, and then you know, going on from that plan would be applying for NDIS, but getting the, uh, the ID, looking at post-release planning and working with them to support them through the uh, justice system, the court process. Um, is there anything else you wish to raise in your oral evidence with the Royal Commission? Uh, not at this point. Uh, I've talked a lot about a range of topics. On yeah. Those are my questions. Thank you very much. Um, if it's okay with you, I'll ask my colleagues if they have any questions to put. And I'll start with Commissioner Mason in Brisbane. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Ms Donahoe, for your evidence uh, this morning. And you've said a, a number of really practical um, recommendations for First Nations um, young people and people with disability in the criminal justice system there in the Northern Territory. Um, the issue of recidiv recidivism, which you've talked about, which is uh, young people who have that psychosocial support, Yes. Um, it's more unlikely that they do enter. Um, it, you've talked about a number of things. What, what would be kind of the most highest priorities around increasing the level of recidivism for particularly First Nations young people with disability children in the criminal justice system? You, uh, sorry, Commissioner Mason, do you mean reducing the level of recidivism? Reducing, sorry, yes. Yeah, reducing yeah, okay. recidivism, returning back into the system. I would, I would have to say probably the number one thing would be intensive case management support that's culturally appropriate and trauma informed and flexible. So from what I, from what I understand with young people, I've seen it a lot is that they'll get allocated a caseworker and they don't connect with that caseworker. And, you know, I've been that caseworker in the past. Um, young people don't connect with everybody. It would be great to have a resource to the point where they can try a couple of different people before they get the right one because often there's a real burden on that young person to do all the connecting when uh, it's a lot easier for an adult who's got some training and background to, to be able to um, change over and allocate another worker for that young person and really try and work with them to meet what their complex needs are. Uh, it's just the, the one size fits all doesn't work. There is just isn't the flexibility there. And uh, it has to be a two way street. Um, and Chair, just one general question, um, uh, Donoghue. Um, we, this week we've heard um, evidence um, and examples of um, hardship, cruelty, punishment a lack of um, kindness to people with disabilities and First Nations people with disabilities in the criminal justice system. In your, in your uh, many years of experience uh, working as a solicitor, uh, have, is, is this issue of recidivism something that is central to the way that the criminal justice system works with First Nations people and children with disability? Is it, is it something that is talked about? Is it... Um, refer to is it embedded in the policy procedures of um, uh, the philosophy, if you use that word, of the criminal justice system in the Northern Territory. Is it is, is it the vision, the goal, or is it more around punishment? In my experience, for the for the for youth and for adults, that the the deterrence factor, the punishment factor, is by far the most predominant. Uh, factor, in my opinion, the system is about punishment. And uh, I mean, when you, when you, when as workers we connect with individuals uh, all the time who are working with uh, young people and adults in the system, and they may not necessarily agree with that approach, and they feel 
really positive relationships, but it's it's an individual based thing. It's not a systems based thing, and it needs to be integrated right through the system of being trauma informed, and it just needs to be a way of thinking at the forefront and reviewed regularly and ensured that every approach that is taken is trauma informed and does have that kindness and. Uh, there is accountability, there is reflection uh, on a continual basis because it's just a very, it is a very heavy system that is embedded in punishment. That, that's my experience. Everyone may not agree with that, but um, having worked in this area since about 1997 in the Territory, I, I feel like that is, that is my experience, that it's very much about you going in, you've got to learn that what you did was wrong and you've got to experience the hardship to do it. And then when you learn and you come out, then you won't do it again. But the issue is that that obviously is a very archaic uh, approach and we have a lot of evidence now that contradicts that and we also know that it just doesn't work. Uh, Our clients and and the, the Indigenous people that are in the justice system have a lot of other things going on, particularly our clients with disability, if they have a disability, they're likely to have trouble uh, with their ability to learn. So they're, they're not got, it, it's, there's a lot behind that. Um, does that answer your question? I'm just Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And I think you're well positioned to have, have a view on this. Thank you. Commissioner McEwen. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Donna Ho for your evidence. My question is about your work with uh, deaf people who you've come come into contact with. Do you work with other people who also work in the deaf community, such as deaf interpreters, uh, deaf advocates, to make sure that you can provide a holistic service? Because what we've heard is that often deaf people uh, Oldland may not be their first sign language, and they also might need extra support to understand the Oldland interpreter. Can you describe yes. any of your work yes. in that area? Um, my experience would concur with what you have described. Uh, we we do work with Oldland interpreters, and we do work with other interpreters. Uh, I've worked with an interpreter that I think recently gave evidence. It it is far too underutilised. And probably before that, one of the biggest issues is that so many clients have not had a hearing test. Trying to get a hearing test to even establish a hearing impairment uh, is exceptionally difficult. And we have a lot of clients that have uh, hearing, hearing impairment. So, and those clients don't have Auslan skills and perhaps haven't developed other other uh, sign language skills so they really do fall into a gap that even if we had have been able to diagnose their hearing impairment they haven't had the support to develop the sign language skills for us to use and interpret it for them so it's it's a, an enormous uh, I, I would go so far as to say with the recommendation around disability screening at the prison that a standard hearing test particularly for um, you know young children that I worked with 20 years ago that had otitis media and other ear issues now have significant hearing impairments and now adults in prison. Um, they really need a hearing test. And uh, we've, we've made lots, I've had a lot of experience with trying to facilitate hearing tests and it's very difficult. There's a long wait list in the public system. It's shorter in the private system, but you have to pay. Um, so I, I know I'm not speaking to specifically accessing uh, interpreters, sign language interpreters per se, but it's just going before that, um, before we can even reach that point, our clients need to be diagnosed with a hearing impairment in the first place. Um, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, in paragraph uh, seven of your statement, uh, Ms., uh, Ms. Donahoe, you refer to your clients almost always having complex trauma histories. Yes. When you use that expression, what are you referring to primarily? So uh, most of our clients would have been uh, through, had multiple uh, adverse childhood experiences, such as the loss of a parent at a young age, 
uh, being around violence, perhaps suffering from neglect and abuse uh, and uh, having multiple traumas, particularly as they grow older, um, having seen violent incidences and uh, lost, had a, a, an enormous amount of grief and loss in their community. Yes, thank you. Um, and my only other question is uh, whether you're familiar with the Goody Way screen. Do you know anything about that? No, I don't, I'm sorry. All right, well, that I ask because it's been the subject of evidence and I just wondered if you would come across that in the um, I have heard of it, but I don't know anything about it, I'm sorry. But that's fine. All right, well, thank you very much uh, for your evidence, your statement and your oral evidence. As you've probably worked out, we're actually operating from four different places today, Darwin, Perth, Sydney and Brisbane. Uh, I think that equals the record, but uh, luckily it uh, goes very smoothly because of the uh, assistance we receive from Law and Order and others. So uh, thank you for participating in this way and thank you for your contributions to the work of the Royal Commission. We very much appreciate it. No worries. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wright, what do we do now? Uh, we'll now move to the panel uh, who will appear on screen. Um, the, our three witnesses now, uh, commissioners, have provided a joint statement dated the 13th of September, which is found at Tender Bundle B, tab 39, and there are annexures A to K. Uh, to their statement, which are also in Tender Bundle B. Um, I understand I'll each swear an oath. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, Mr. Collins, Ms. Barter and uh, Ms. Greenoff, Greenoff, thank you very much for uh, coming to uh, the Royal Commission, this time in Perth, to give evidence today. Thank you also for the uh, detailed written statement that we have received uh, from you and which we uh, have uh, read. Um, we're grateful for your willingness to give uh, oral evidence today to supplement uh, the written statement. Uh, I would be grateful if uh, you follow the instructions of uh, Commissioner Mason's associate and she will administer the oath to each of you. I will read you all the oath. At the end, please all say yes or I do. Do you swear by almighty God that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Yes. Um, you probably heard me say just a minute ago where everybody is, but I'll repeat it just to be sure. You were in the same hearing room uh, with uh, Commissioner McEwen. Uh, Commissioner Mason is in the Brisbane hearing room of the Royal Commission. I am located in the Sydney hearing room, uh, as is Ms Wright, and I will now ask Ms Wright to ask you some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr Collins, could you state your full name? My full name is Peter Francis Collins. And you're the Director of Legal Services at the Aboriginal Legal Service of Western Australia? That's correct. And you've held that role since 2005? I have. Uh, over many years, you've appeared for Aboriginal clients, including many with disabilities, both adults and young people who have been charged with criminal offences. That's right. And uh, you've taken a leading role, uh, including of late, in writing to government, including to the Minister uh, for corrective services to raise issues about the conditions in custody for Aboriginal prisoners and detainees, including to draw attention to their uh, cognitive and other disabilities and the urgent need for therapeutic uh, support. Go ahead. Um, I'll come back to that. And Ms Barter, um, if you could state your name, please, for the record. Yes, Alice Vivian Barter and you're the Managing Lawyer of ALSWA Civil Law and Human Rights Unit. That's correct. And uh, you're responsible, among other areas, for uh, the organisation's work on prisoners' rights and advocacy for young people in the youth justice system. Yes, that's correct. 
and uh, you've also been with the organisation since 2005? Yes, on and off. Um, do you currently lead a team of about 20 people, including nine lawyers, in representing clients' rights, including on youth justice issues? Yes. And we, did you represent VYZ in the Supreme Court of Western Australia in judicial review proceedings, uh, which recently uh, successfully challenged the legality of lockdowns at Banksia Hill Detention Centre in respect of VYZ? Yes. And Miss uh, Greenoff, if you could please state your name for the record. Yes, Sasha Lee Greenoff. And you're a diversion officer in ALSWA's Youth Engagement Program. That is correct. And I'm also the supervising diversion officer for the Kimberley <coughs> And I'm also the team leader for the adult bail support service for the Perth Metro and the Kimberley region. Thank you for that. And you're a First Nations woman from the Jaru in the Kimberley region? Yes, that's correct. I'm a proud Jaru woman from the Kimberley region of Western Australia. I'm also a proud Jawan woman from the Northern Territory. And uh, your role in the Youth Engagement Program or YEP is to provide culturally uh, secure support to children uh, between the ages of 10 and 17 uh, through case management and mentoring, uh, court support and uh, advocacy and you also refer young people to external programs and services? Yes, that is correct. And uh, many of the children and young people that you support live with disabilities? That is correct. Um, your title is Diversion Officer, uh, but do you through the YEP also support young people uh, while they are detained in custody? That is correct. And uh, how does the YEP engage with young people whilst they are in detention? We have weekly visits. Um, so in the Perth metro region, the diversion officers will book appointments to visit the young people um, at the Bankshire Hill Detention Centre. Um, and our diversion officers um, in our broom office will either come in via telephone or via video link to speak to their clients. What sort of support are you providing to young people whilst they're in detention as opposed to whilst they're in the community? We provide mentorship. Um, some of the clients that we work with, because we are Aboriginal diversion officers, we, they don't see us as just diversion officers. So we may be classed as an older sister, an older brother, an auntie, an uncle, or even in a mothering, nurturing role. Um, so... In, when we have uh, meetings with them, um, we, we play cards with them. Um, we just sit down and have a yarn, um, just check on their well-being, um, to see if they're okay, um, and just basically talk about um, what they want to do, their goals, their aspirations. Um, we also are role models for these young people as well. Um, now, your joint statement uh, speaks strongly to the overrepresentation of Aboriginal young people in juvenile detention in Western Australia and also to the prevalence of uh, neurodevelopmental and cognitive impairments in those young people and the trauma history uh, in your clients that you see. Um, at an individual level, when you have a client who has, uh, who's in detention, uh, what, what information is available to ALSWA to identify uh, the nature of uh, that young person's disabilities and their support needs? Before I um, speak further, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we meet today, the Wajak Noongar people. We acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and contributions to the Wajak Noongar nation. We also pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And we also acknowledge the strength, the resilience of our First Nations colleagues and clients. And to go to your question, I'd like to answer that by saying, in the court system, um, we receive the neuropsychological reports from the lawyers. 
um, we then obtain leave from the court to um, have a copy of that. Um, we always um, obtain leave to have a copy of that for ourselves for the youth engagement program, also Centrelink, education and medical. So then once we've received that report, we then uh, speak to the family because we work very closely with the family and the young person. And we explain to them in a culturally safe way on, on the neuropsychological report, what it details and what the diagnosis is. And then from there, we then um, access NDIS, which is a, which is a lengthy process. Um, but we walk through that process with the family um, and we start with the pre-planning appointments. Then once the pre-planning appointments come about, then we then, um, the young person will then receive uh, NDIS plan. And once we've received that NDIS plan, then we can refer the young person to get support coordination um, and also therapeutic support. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Collins, is it routine for a young person who's admitted into Banksia Hill Detention Centre to have a diagnosis? Yes, although a and lot don't as well. A lot won't have a diagnosis? That's right. Um, and so it is not a routine, it's not systemic that an assessment is made either at the court level or uh, once the person enters into the detention centre? It depends at a court level whether the court orders a, a psychological or a neuropsychological or a psychiatric report. Um, when young people enter the Banksy Hill Detention Centre, there's a process of screening, but sometimes these diagnoses aren't made. Um, to your knowledge, is uh, any uh, assessment, uh, particular assessment made uh, to diagnose uh, FASD or any cognitive impairment uh, for new detainees? There's a FASD diagnosis undertaken usually, yes. Um, now, um, um, one of the things uh, you've talked about in your statement is, of course, the YEP or the Youth Engagement Program. Um, does that program operate on uh, therapeutic trauma-informed principles? Yes, it does. It's a culturally secure, therapeutic, holistic, individualised service. Does it operate statewide? No. Uh, where does it operate in Western Australia? Currently, it's operating, um, as you've heard, in Perth. There's also YEP, we call it a YEP in Broome, which services Broome Court and Derby Court. And we've recently received funding, but it, the program hasn't commenced for uh, Kununurra in the East Kimberley and for South Headland in the Pilbara. But the rest of the state does not have access to the service. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you've provided in one of the case studies, case study H, uh, which is paragraph 55, an example of a client assisted by YEP in detention. Uh, he was a young person diagnosed with a language disorder and FASD, and uh, the YEP helped him to apply for an NDIS plan. Uh, when he was released from detention. And That's while correct. he was in detention, uh, you were able, or the YEP was able to organise some therapy services in the form of an occupational therapist and a social worker to attend. Uh, was that to attend Banksia Hill Detention Centre? Yes, it was, as I understand it. Um, H Ms. was Ms Greenoff's client, so she knows a lot more about him than I do. Ms Greenoff, was that only possible uh, because there was an NDIS plan and because of uh, ALS WA's efforts to arrange that support for H? That is correct. Um, and uh, you've said at paragraph 55 that apart from uh, that support, he did not receive therapeutic support for his uh, disabilities while he was in detention. That is correct. 
Um, how common is it for you or ALS to organise that sort of support uh, through NDIS for a young person who is in detention? Unfortunately, all the youth clients that are represented by ALS don't become a YEP client. So we only have capacity to service a small amount of clients, but those clients that are on our program um, do receive that individualised support with NDIS and other supports um, that are needed for them um, in custody. Does that assume that they are on an NDIS plan or are a certain proportion are not in the system, so to speak? That is correct, not in the system. Uh, is it rare for a young person to have an NDIS plan and to be able to access support or is it commonplace? It's common. Um, now, still on H, your joint state, statement records that he instructed ALS um, that on some days he was allowed out of his cell for only 10 minutes. Now, my question may not be directed to you, Ms. Greenhoff, but the uh, case study uh, records that on some days he was allowed out for only 10 minutes. Um, to state what may be obvious, um, are you saying he was locked in his cell alone for 23 hours and 50 minutes on those days? That is correct. <clears throat> um, what are clients telling you currently, uh, perhaps Ms. Barter, this is a question for you, um, about the duration of uh, lockdowns they are experiencing at Banksia Hill? Yes, we have um, numerous clients in Bankshire Hill at the moment. We have instructions from at least 30 different children over the last eight months who have experienced what they call rolling lockdowns due to staff shortages. So that means the child is locked in their cell, um, which is a very small, stark room, often without a TV, sometimes with a TV, and they will be given all their meals in that cell. And often they'll be let out only for one phone call. And the children are told it's a one 10 minute phone call. Once you finish your phone call back to your cell and locked back down. And they're called rolling because they roll through and each child is allowed up one at a time. And in Bankshire Hill currently, those rolling lockdowns due to staff shortages are still occurring. We have instructions as recently as this week that particularly on the weekends, the staff shortages mean that they are being locked down the children who are, removed, who are transferred to the maximum security prison, Casuarina, they're in unit 18 there. We have instructions that they have been in lockdown for days on end for the last few weeks, only being allowed out of their cell for 10 minutes a day. Um, I'll come back to, to that. You, you acted for v, VYZ in the Supreme Court. Uh, he was a 14 year old boy. Is that right? That's right. He was 14 when he went into custody and he turned 15 while he was in Bankshire Hill. Um, and he was not the subject of any uh, confinement order made, made by the superintendent uh, for, uh, to authorise that he be locked into, in his cell. That's is right. That right? Uh, there are two ways in which such an order can be made. One is uh, if the young person has committed uh, some form of disciplinary offence, a order can be made authorising lockdown under the legislation. Yes, that's right. Or they can be um, an order for the good order management security of the detention centre. Uh, but the legislation in those cases still requires a certain amount of time out of cell. Yes, and even when those orders are in place, often the children are not allowed out um, the maximum under the statute, the Young Offenders Act, what they are allowed. Um, but also the Young Offenders Act only, only um, dictates that a small amount of time per day has to be out of the cell. And so the ALS would call on the Young Offenders Act to be reformed in that way so that the children are entitled to time out of their cell and time in fresh air. Because often the time when out of their cell is still within the unit, within the wing. Um, so it's within a building and they've told us that there's days on end where they have not had any fresh air. Um, in respect of VYZ, 
if I could just recall for those who perhaps haven't read the judgment, the evidence in the Supreme Court was that during the 20 to 24 hour lockdowns, uh, which he endured for at least 26 dates in the first half of this year, uh, he didn't have conversations with uh, the officers or other boys. Uh, he did not attend school or receive any education. Uh, and the only thing said to him on days when he was allowed out for 10 minutes on some occasion by guards was uh, be good, behave. Yes, that's right. And on the dates of four to six June of this year, for the 72, 72 hours of those three days, he was locked in his cell for 70 hours of them. So there were multiple days where he was in lockdown as well. And the judgment records that his evidence in the Supreme Court was that he felt like the walls were coming in at him and uh, that his head was spinning inside his cell. Um, is what VYZ told you about what occurred during the almost full day lockdowns and how he felt in his cell, was that specific to him or do you hear that kind of thing from clients? We hear it all the time from all different clients who many have diagnoses and some don't have diagnoses. But I think some of us who have experienced isolation due to COVID can try and empathise with the feeling of not having any social interaction with others and how hard that is for our mental health. Um, but these are children who are teenagers who need to be developing and a lot of them do have um, FASD or other neurodevelopmental language disorders and other, um, other disorders. And they've also experienced complex trauma in their lives. So it does really badly affect their mental health. We have a huge, huge number of self-harm attempts at both Bankshire Hill and the children who have been moved to Casuarina Prison. And it's extremely concerning um, the way that we're compounding their trauma and really affecting their development. If uh, the young people are detained in a cell for 23 hours a day, let us say, what is it that they can actually do in that cell? What, Very are the, what are the activities, if any, that are available to them? Very little. What I've been told is that they just basically try and sleep and lie in their bed and they're just alone with their thoughts. Occasionally they are given education packages, but many of them are not able to engage with just um, paper given to them without someone actually teaching them. And so they say they just try and sleep and they often don't know the time difference between night and day. Thank you. To be clear, is there any radio or television in cells? It depends. There is often radio and television. Um, sometimes it is taken away as a punishment and sometimes it doesn't work either because there's been some issue with the technology or because the child has damaged it in their distress. Um, sometimes in the intensive support unit, the TVs are on channels that the guards can control only. And they'll often, we've been told, put on channels um, like um, news from overseas, um, sort of channels that the children would not be interested in. Um, and they will make, they'll make that decision as to what channel it'll be on. Mm -hmm. um, can I ask, are they in solitary cells? Are they able to hear what's going on with other people in there? Yes, it depends. All the cells, as far as I'm aware, in Bankshire Hill and also in Unit 18 at Casuarina only has one child per cell. In some of the cells, they can shout to each other and speak with each other, which they do do. But some um, units, they're different materials. So some it's less um, easy and some it's easier. In the intensive support unit, which is the... Um, sort of crisis care unit you know, or the punishment area in Bankshire Hill, often the children can actually see the other children there due to the glass um, in the cells. And we've been told they can also then communicate with them, but also see when they're in distress and when they're self-harming, which is ex extremely distressing to the other children. 
Thank you. Um, Ms. Barty, you've said that sometimes they end up, I imagine more than sometimes, frustrated uh, and distressed and cause damage to property. Um, are the children and young people then uh, sometimes placed in the intensive support unit uh, for management following those sorts of incidents? Yes, that's right. Uh, and you've given some examples uh, in your joint statement, uh, which record uh, those kinds of in incidents. For example, paragraph 41, uh, case study B and case study C, uh, where um, you've recorded that the capacity of young people who have disabilities, in particular to deal with lockdowns is very difficult. Yes. Um, how would you describe the physical environment for children and young people with sensory sensitivities and cognitive impairments at Banksia Hill? I'll come to Unit 18 in a moment. There's, um, it's, a, it's a prison. It, there's very stark environment with grey painted walls, toilets that are bolted to the ground and beds that are part of the... Um, wall, I guess, with a, sometimes a mattress, sometimes not a mattress. Um, they're extremely dirty. We've been told that there's urine, spit and vomit often on cells, particularly in the ISU, but also in the other cells. The cells have been damaged because the children have been locked in there and don't have anything else to do. So they become distressed and they have damaged cells. And so that hasn't always been fixed. So they've said to us that they do get just very dysregulated in that environment. Um, there's also, like I said before, lack of fresh air. Sometimes they, the cells can be very cold. Sometimes the cells can be very hot. Um, and so there's no sort of um, soft sensory furnishings or anything to help children calm down when they are feeling dysregulated. What about the sounds and the light? It depends. The light can be very harsh and um, be on, be kept on for a long time. At other times, the lights can be turned off, particularly the Commission heard evidence earlier in the week after the May 2017 riots when the electricity was just totally off, so the children were locked in um, pitch black. Um, the sounds, it's a very violent place, Bankshire Hill. When we've been visiting, there's been a lot of cries of distress um, a lot of, we've heard guards belittle and speak down to children, a lot of shouting and that sort of thing. Um, I've never heard um, a lot of sort of rehabilitative or therapeutic words being spoken to the children, but I have heard um, some very sort of the opposite of that. Um, and we've heard belittling language. We've heard children being teased about their disabilities. We've heard children being teased about when they have got dysregulated. And we've heard about guards using extremely violent um, mechanisms. In that case study, that child was restrained and an officer was restraining on his neck. And we've heard of many, many officers punching and hitting um, these very young children. The special operations group go in with riot shields and riot um, clothing and they will go in with batons and also OC or capsicum spray. Um, so any sort of dysregulation or any um, issues of damage are dealt with extremely violently and extremely punitively. When you say you've heard teasing about disability, have you personally heard that sort of thing? We, I have, I have personally heard um, guards sort of um, diminish the seriousness of self-harm. For example, I gave a business card to a child in ISU. This was quite a few years ago now. And um, the guard sort of had a bit of a go at me and said, what are you thinking, giving the child a piece of cardboard, like a business card? Um, you know that all these children self-harm and they use whatever they can. Um, and I found that quite intimidating, the way that he spoke to me. Mm -hmm. um, now... Uh, you've 
Well, before I move on to that, is, is there any part of Banksia Hill Detention Centre that might be considered a more therapeutic environment, at least in the way it appears physically? I haven't been to every single unit because we haven't. We just go to the visits area or we go and see our clients in the unit if there's staff shortages or in ISU. So I haven't seen every part of it, but my understanding is no. Um, there is the case planning, case management officers who do work very well with the children. Um, but as far as the physical layout, I haven't seen anything that I would call therapeutic. Um, now you've, in the joint statement, you've all expressed your concerns about the detainees or some detainees recently being transferred out of Banksy Hill into the Casuarina prison. Is that known as Unit 18? Yes. And uh, when did any of you most recently visit Unit 18? Peter visited this week. I went to the visits area used for detainees in Unit 18 at Casuarina Prison yesterday. And what ages are your current clients who are in Unit 18? Oh, they range anywhere 14. from 14 through to 17 years of age. And are you able to provide an indication as to the nature of their disabilities, if any? Well, as an example, the client I saw yesterday is 17 years of age. He's from a remote part of the state. He's been diagnosed with FASD, PTSD, and has a very significant trauma history, which almost defies belief. Um, and he was remanded in custody a week or so ago spent overnight in Banksia Hill Detention Centre and the very next morning was transported into Unit 18. So in other words, there was no misbehaviour by him, so to speak, in Banksia Hill on this occasion, in my view, to warrant his transfer to Unit 18. And do you say that because Unit 18 has been used for uh, the more problematic detainees to date? It's, it's used to punish the more problematic detainees. Uh, but this client you saw yesterday doesn't fall into that category? The client I saw yesterday is one of many clients that ALS Act for who cycles relentlessly in and out of Banksia Hill and he's had behavioural issues in the past in Banksia Hill, which has led to him being held in the ISU. But on this occasion, there's no evidence that I'm aware of to suggest there was any misbehaviour warranting the transfer to Unit 18. I see. Um, it's so a, in your view, it's a kind of anticipatory uh, confinement. Yes. Chair, it goes further than that. This, this language might see, be seen to be emotive and um, perhaps a little over the top, but my, of, of what I've heard about Unit 18 and what I've seen about the ISU, these are punitive Dickensian places which are designed to punish these children for their misdeeds and squeeze the very humanity out of them. What do you expect if you're locking up a 17-year-old boy with FASD, PTSD and other impairments from an extreme trauma history? What do you expect if you lock that boy up for 23 hours and 50 minutes each day, which is what he has endured in the last week or so since he's been in Unit 18? The descriptions often used at these places are monster factories, and that's exactly what it is. The chances of recidivism in this environment are exponentially high. They're not rehabilitative. <laughs> How, in, in the light of your experience, which is obviously very extensive, how can this cycle be interrupted? It, it, it can be interrupted but it requires 
an entire refocus by government on this space, on, on justice. Aboriginal people in Western Australia are the most over-policed and over-imprisoned over in the country, if not the world. One in 15 Aboriginal men are in custody as we speak. So the current approaches have failed abysmally. And it's not a question, Chair, of providing additional funding or instituting new programs. It requires a whole reimagining by government, bringing the community with it as to the nature of the relationship with First Nations people in this state. It starts with the big picture things, something akin to a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, followed by a treaty, followed by the establishment of Aboriginal people in their state in their rightful place in this place. What can then follow is Aboriginal led, designed and implemented processes and programs to deal with young people who are ending up in places like Banksia Hill, ISU and Unit 18. Government can't contr keep control on the levers in relation to this because they have continued to repeat the failures of the past. Aboriginal people need to have the power to look after themselves, their communities and their young people because the rates of recidivism, as Commissioner Mason talked about earlier, in relation to children that we've been speaking about today, particularly kids with disability, are exponential. North of 70%. And so many of our clients with disabilities have spent lengthy periods of time in juvenile detention, simply transition once they turn 18 into the adult jail system and they literally rot away. And what they're then faced with at the completion of their terms of imprisonment as adults is an act application under the high risk serious offender laws, which may result in a custodial order, a custody order, I should say, which could result in their indefinite imprisonment. So the picture is incredibly bleak and tinkering at the edges is not going to get a result. And I know what I've spoken about is very aspirational, but we need to start the process. And this state has been a laggard in that regard. It has been a laggard. There is no appetite as I discern it. And I've raised it with senior bureaucrats within the Western Australian bureaucracy about the possibility of treaty and so on, and it's not on the agenda. It's not on the agenda. We can't even get Aboriginal sentencing courts on the radar in this state. We can't even get those on the radar. Whereas in other jurisdictions, Victoria, for example, Curry courts have been in place for over 15 years. And there is Can a reconciliation a process underway in Victoria. I'm sorry, Chair, I didn't hear that. Sorry, I, I believe there is a reconciliation process through uh, one of the inquiries that's been established in Victoria. Absolutely. Mm. I'm sorry, Commissioner Mason, I think, wanted to ask a question. Yeah, um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, Mr Collins, is, uh, you're talking about Curry Courts which are um, operating on the East Coast. Are you saying that there's no similar court in Western Australia? It, there's one court called the Bandi Malgu Domestic Violence Court in Geraldton. That's it. So we have the Nunga Court in South Australia, Koori Court, Murray Court. 
but not in the largest state of Western Australia we have anything similar. No. And I've been told when I raised it and the current government were re-elected in March last year that because Aboriginal sentencing courts weren't part of the package of electoral promises, that it wasn't going to be considered during this term. So we've got a court um, system with churns. We've got a court system, and this applies both in the adult courts and the children's court, which churns Aboriginal adults and young people with disabilities through the system relentlessly, sending them to custody only for them to get nothing out of that experience, to be thrown back into often cesspools of dysfunction and de deprivation, only to re-offend again and land back in custody. Can I give you an example? Because it's easy to talk about these things, but I've acted for clients. I'll give you, give you one example, if I may, please. I've acted for a young man from the Nunanjara lands, which are west of, sorry, they are east of Kalgoorlie. He's from the desert. The last time I acted for him, he was 26 or thereabouts. I'd acted for him when he was a juvenile, when he was a young person. He started sniffing petrol when he was three. He was given petrol by his mother. His dad was in and out of jail. His mother had mental health issues. He was on the radar of child protection services from about the age of three. They knew he was sniffing petrol. Police witnessed him sniffing petrol. Because he spent most of his younger years locked up, he didn't go through traditional law initiation practices as is the norm. So he was treated as a boy by his community and was worthless. In jail, he was loathed because he didn't have the cognitive capacity to understand you shouldn't pour another prisoner's detergent powder on the floor. On it went. He gets out, he goes to the community where he's from, he's a pariah, He's playing football one day. The other boys wouldn't kick the football. His response was to pick up an iron bar and go and hit his auntie over the head with it because she was laughing at him, causing grievous bodily harm, and he goes to jail. There were no interventions whatsoever for this young person at any stage along his journey through the justice system. Now, that's an indictment on Western Australia it's an indictment on the country, but it, I could give you countless similar examples of this. And it's hard not to think that government is happy to have these Aboriginal people locked up because if they're locked up, they're out of sight and out of mind. And I'll talk to you about intergenerational trauma as well, if I may. And I know I've got the floor, but I may as well use it if I can. Yeah, just, just if you don't don't mind, just do this reasonably briefly because I do want to give Ms. Wright the opportunity of asking some more questions of the panel. I can't remember what uh, case example this client was. I think it was case example. Case example C. He was my client. This is what intergenerational trauma looks like for this child. In 2005, an older biological relative won a joke telling competition at the pub. He took his prize money home and seriously assaulted, causing life threatening injuries to his female partner, who happened to be the client's aunt in the Aboriginal way. He then took that woman's two children, one was a toddler and the other was about four. He took them out to the cemetery on the outskirts of the regional town in remote WA where he lived. 
and using his skills that he'd learned as a ringer, he strung up the 14 month old and hanged him. In the face of the cries by the four year old, he did the same to her. He then drove to the local police station and confessed to killing them and was sentenced to life imprisonment. That client's family never spoke about it, not once. So it's a dark secret in the family history and there was no intervention provided by anyone to help the family get through the trauma and grief that he inevitably would have experienced. That was inter intergenerational trauma in practice in the lives of this boy. And he is the boy I saw yesterday. He's the boy who's back in Unit 18, <laughs> locked up for 23 hours and 50 minutes every day. Yes, Ms. Wright, I think, uh, if you don't mind resuming. Me. Thank you. Um, you've said a, a whole new approach is required, and I'll come to that in a moment. Just still on Unit 18, do the young people there have access to education and programs? Well, on the end, I asked my client yesterday, um, Ms. Wright, whether he was getting an education. He said no. Um, do you have access as a lawyer to confidential communications with your clients at Unit 18? No. Um, when you say no, what do you mean? Um, first of all, you're, you're allocated one hour maximum to see clients in Unit 18. They are escorted by guards from Unit 18 to a visits area, which is the area which is usually used for social visits by family and friends to adult prisoners. It's a wide area with desks that are bolted to the ground with a little barrier in the middle in between the prisoner and the visitor. Um, when my client came to see me, he was in the company of two other young Aboriginal people who were being seen by another ALS lawyer. We're all in the same area and there were five guards on the perimeter watching and listening. So there's no lawyer client confidentiality whatsoever. And the other thing is, these kids have got hearing problems. So you can't talk quietly because they can't hear you. So now, do the young people have access to psychologists at Unit 18? or other welfare, non-custodial staff? I don't know. I can, I can answer that. They do have access to psychologists and they have been seeing, our clients have been seeing psychologists while in Unit 18. However, they're only available at certain times. And so many children have said to us, when I've called for a psychologist saying, I need to speak with them now, they haven't been available until days after and by then sometimes the child doesn't want to talk about what was troubling them at the time so it can be um, very ad hoc and it can be very difficult for the clients to speak with psychologists I've been told that it's difficult for children to speak with medical professionals um, but I have also been told that the psychologists who are seeing some of the young boys are actually um, doing a really good job and the boys have got a good relationship with them um, you, you might not be able to answer this, but are they dedicated staff at Banksia Hill? I'm talking about psychologists and other non-custodial staff, or are they shared with, uh, sorry, at, at Unit 18, are they shared with Banksia Hill? My understanding is that they are, but I'm not sure exactly how the division is, is made. Um, now, the department has said, and you'd be aware of this, uh, all of you, I assume that there will be a new operating philosophy, uh, which is to be implemented at Banksia Hill Detention Centre. You're aware of that? Yes. Uh, and, and in fact, um, you have attached to your joint statement uh, some of your complaints to the minister and others about the conditions at Banksia Hill together with uh, responses at Annexure C to your joint statement. 
uh, in, I think, what is the most recent letter, the 27th of April from the Minister to you, Mr Collins, he said that a newly developed contemporary model of care for young people in custody will be implemented in the near future to provide a more focused operation at Banksia Hill. That's great. Um, now, um, in terms of how that will look and be implemented, uh, do you have any knowledge about that at this stage? We have had a briefing from the Deputy Commissioner, which involved showing us some of the words on um, a screen, um, some of the words that talked about having the child, listening to the children and developing the children. Um, we haven't been told anything further. We are concerned that it's not gonna be trauma informed and culturally appropriate for our clients. They've tried to change the operating philosophy over the last 10 years at Bankshire Hill, and each time it has failed, my understanding is due to the culture of the officers at Bankshire Hill. We're extremely concerned that they have not put in the work to change this operating philosophy, and the ALS was not consulted um, by the consulting group. When you refer to the officers, the staff with whom the children and young people have most contact are the youth custodial officers, is that right? Yes, that's right. And they are the staff who interact with them uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, give them instructions, talk to them about meals, etc. cetera? Yes. Um, and do the young people know them by their title, youth custodial officer? Yes. Um, are they uniformed or in plain clothes? Yes, they're uniformed. Um, do you have a view about whether the word custodial is helpful when seeking to provide for the most healing environment possible for a young person? Yes, I do. My view is that the officers who are working with the children need to be youth workers and they can have custodial training as well as youth training. My view is that they should be wearing plain clothes so that they don't have that look that is very intimidating and punitive towards the children. My understanding is that how it's, that's how it's done in Victoria. I worked at the Parkville Youth Detention Centre in Victoria in 2011, and we wore plain clothes. And there was also a casual pool, which I was in. And we then, you know, I used to work on the weekend, so it meant that if the full-time pool is off work for whatever reason, or they can't get the staffing numbers, like I've been told recently, then there's many people who can work casually and there are many people in the community working for various youth um, organisations. There's many people who are qualified in youth work or social work who would be able to work with these children and mentor them and give them the support they require. And then there'd be much less incidents in my view. Um, you'd acknowledge that safety and security is essential in a detention centre. And therefore there has to be some staff who deal with uh, ensuring safety and security yes of in course the nature of custodial staff yes and the the staff do need the training in restraining um, children but as um, the first witness witness Jasmine said they put a lot of time into training the staff on how to restrain children why isn't there more time spent on de-escalation on speaking with children understanding disability understanding trauma so they can communicate and de-escalate in my view, both police and officers at Bankshire Hill and also prison officers for that matter, would be a lot safer if they spoke to the people who they're looking after with respect and showed that de-escalation um, techniques. All of us in all our many years of working at ALS, working with some of the most violent offenders at both Bankshire and adult prisons, we've never felt unsafe ever. And it's the way that we're, we're communicating with people and um, the way that we are treating them with respect. You've said in your statement that, in your experience, young people with cognitive disabilities can have difficulties self-regulating and following rules. And when the response of officers is punitive or otherwise not appropriate to the individual young person's disability, those difficulties are compounded and it's perceived as acting out in this behaviour. 
Yes, that's right. My understanding is that the children go into the fight or flight response, which we all have. It's our innate response. And they often haven't learned coping mechanisms. I asked some questions of Dr. James Fitzpatrick during the Kimberley Youth Suicides Inquest a few years ago around how children with FASD will deal with punitive responses and changes in routine at Bankshire Hill. And he explained that it's very difficult for children to regulate themselves when they're being dealt with in a punitive way. And when there is violence being, um, being the way that they're, they're treated, even just moving from one cell to the other, it's all done in an incredibly violent way. And so whatever the title of the role, the people who are dealing with the children and young people on a day-to-day -day basis, the people who are currently fulfilling the function of youth custodial officer, um, do you agree they have a very important role when it comes to ensuring that any new philosophy uh, is successful? Yes, that's right. And the current case planning um, staff who are more of the case workers and youth workers, they could be integrated with the youth custodial officers, either the same person being both roles or being more integrated um, and having more leadership and mentorship. The children have also said that the um, managers of each unit change around very frequently, so they're with different adults every day. So some continuity and consistency would go a long way to to being sort of a parental figure, I guess, for these children. Do the children tend to move around themselves or do they stay within the one unit or cell throughout their particular term? I've been told that many are moved around. And I'm not exactly sure of the reasons for that. Um, and again, you might not be able to answer, but to your knowledge, do the youth custodial officers work together with the non-custodial staff, such as the education staff and the program staff, or do they tend to work in relative silos? It's when it difficult. comes to planning for uh, what the young people need? I, I don't know specifically, but my perception is that it's quite separate. Um, now, you've set out in your statement um, that ALS has made many complaints uh, to the government, including about the amount of time that young people have spent in their cells. And uh, you recorded in those letters your concerns about the prevalence of uh, neurodevelopmental impairment among the detainees and the practices at the centre. Um, you've provided to the Royal Commission responses you've received and you said you consider them to be inadequate. Um, in the most recent response, uh, the Minister uh, informed you, as has been announced publicly, that there's been an announcement that $25.1 million has been announced for improving youth detention services, and that includes... Uh, money for critical infrastructure at Banksia Hill, including for a new crisis care unit. Um, do you wish to comment on those initiatives? Yes, I might let Mr Collins comment. Our concern is those initiatives will focus excessively on infrastructure at Banksia Hill Detention Centre to the detriment of everything else. And that was reflected in a meeting we had with the Minister in February, March this year, where that issue was discussed. The focus is from what we gleaned from the Minister on improving the infrastructure in Banksy Hill. So, for example, detainees can't climb on the roofs of units, precluding them from climbing on an internal fence within the unit as well. And a very strong focus on officer safety, which we understand implicitly is very important and can't be ignored. However, the minister also made a comment that they were going to construct units within Banksia Hill to deal with the mad and the bad. 
So that was the characterization he placed on it. Two units, one for the mad and one for the bad. And I think it speaks volumes as to the level of engagement in that portfolio and that sort of language is being used. Sorry, where do you say that comment was made? At the meeting that um, ALS attended and myself and Miss Barter were there when the minister used those very words. Did you hear those words, Miss Barter? Yes, I did. Now, um, not seeking to question what you said, Mr Collins, um, You've said to the minister in your correspondence, Mr. Collins, that you think this is likely a once in a lifetime opportunity to make some tangible and sustainable change at Banksia Hill. That's correct. And do you have a view about the wisdom or otherwise of having a single detention centre for young people in a state as large as Western Australia? It's a vexed question. Um, on the one hand, with the detention centre being in Perth, you have young people from, say, Columbaroo in at the very tip of eastern Kimberley in Western Australia being transported thousands and thousands of kilometres to Banksia Hill and the dis dislocation from family, community and culture, which flows from that inevitably. But on the other hand, if a new detention centre was built, for example, in the Kimberley, the expression we use, build it and they'll come. So it makes it much easier for courts to, for example, remand a young Aboriginal person in the Kimberley to a detention centre that they know is in the Kimberley. And the West Kimberley Regional Prison outside of Derby is proof positive of that. Almost all the prisoners in that prison are Aboriginal and it is touted as an Aboriginal prison. Um, I, I think if I can expand, I think if there's consideration to be given by government about decentralising, for want of a better word, the focus needs to be, as I said earlier, on engaging Aboriginal communities and Aboriginal community controlled organisations in the design of a, a, perhaps a facility which enables young people to get on country, to reconnect with culture and so on and so forth as an alternative to the stark Dickensian conditions which obviously exist currently in Banksy Hill, in my view. Um, are you aware of any uh, therapeutic communities that exist within the correctional system, the adult correctional system in WA? There's, there's Wandu, um, I'm, I've forgotten the correct title of it, but Wandu is um, a women's prison which is used for women who are, are leading up to the end of their se sentence or towards their parole eligibility date as a transition process to uh, going back into the community. Aside from Wandu, to my knowledge, there's nothing else. But there is an example of it having been done um, in your state. Yes, that's correct. Um, now, uh, in terms of the new operating philosophy, uh, to your knowledge, has the minister referred to it as being a trauma-informed model of care or a trauma-informed approach for young people? I believe so, yes. Okay. Um, you've set out in your joint statement some detailed recommendations, uh, particularly at paragraph 77 to 78 of your statement about to, how to improve um, youth detention. Um, clearly, 
there's quite a lot to be done. Um, as a practical matter, apart from obviously the cessation of the excessive lockdowns, which are an issue, what are the main changes you'd like to see implemented? And if you could focus from a perspective of young people with disabilities, um, and if I could ask all of you uh, to answer that question, uh, perhaps starting with you, Ms. Greenoff. I think it needs to, there needs to be more First Nations people working within the system, whether that be them being employed by the Department of Justice or them coming in um, from a non-profit organisation. Um, they, from working with the youth engagement program, I can see the success that we have with engaging with uh, First Nations children with disability. And I can see the success with the NDIS plans and the understanding of the diagnosis within the family. So I think that there needs to be a culturally safe way of whether it coming through at, in admissions of them knowing, okay, this young person has a disability. Um, what supports are we going to provide this young person um, whilst they're in on remand, in custody, whatever you'd like to call it. But it also needs to be followed up, obviously with medical professionals, but Indigenous people need to be um, in, have engagement with that medical professional to actually <coughs> let the young person understand what is actually going on as well. You referred to the success of the YEP program. Um, is that funded by the Department of Justice? That is correct. And one of your suggested changes is to, uh, for the, there to be a partnership between the department and YEP uh, um, to provide adequate numbers of staff, professionals and youth workers and ensure young people in detention are not being locked down in their cells. So are you, what is that getting at, that there should be an expansion of the YEP program in some manner? Yes, I think that particular part was if the department are saying they can't get the staff immediately, then there are other workers in the community who could be seconded or could go in as an urgent measure. And long-term, it might look a bit different from that. And uh, Ms. Barter, what are the main changes you'd like to see apart from uh, confinement practices being dramatically reduced? As Ms. Ms. Greenoff said, the, the training in making sure that it's culturally safe and having First Nations people working alongside non-First Nations people, trauma-informed and disability care and de-escalation there needs to be a whole change from the punitive approach um, to mentoring the children and ensuring that they're rehabilitated, that they're getting education, should be the Department of Education running the school, not the Department of Corrective Services. There should be more medical support. Um, again, there should be medical support from Department of Health Services, not Department of Corrective Services. Um, the list is very long. We should also raise the age to make sure that the 10, 11, 12 and 13 year olds are not being held in custody at all. Raise the age to at least 14. The ALS's view is also that there should be a minimum age of incarceration of 16. So that whole young cohort can be managed in the community with early intervention, family support, wraparound holistic services. And Mr Collins, what would you like to see? I think Ms. Barter and Ms. Greenoff have covered it. Um, a couple of other things. I think there needs to be a comprehension health assessment undertaken when a young person first enters Banksia Hill to enable the diagnosis of all of the conditions that all of us are very familiar with, not the least of which is hearing issues because it is well established that Aboriginal people have poor hearing, often diagnosed. The other 
reform I would like to see is the availability of interpreters within Banksy Hill Detention Centre. There are no interpreters used to my knowledge and I've witnessed education classes undertaken by clients of mine who speak an Aboriginal language as their first or second language in English. And I've asked them, did you understand what was being said in your school class? And the answer is no. And I think that's something that can be easily remedied um, if the resources are there. One final thing, We're, one of the positives in Western Australia is that we have an inspector for custodial services, which performs an invaluable role in shining a light on conditions in places like Banksy Hill. However, my concern about the inspector's roles, role is that most of the very helpful and useful recommendations are conveniently ignored by government. There should be reform of the relevant legislation to mandate a response by government where recommendations are made for reform and that those responses are tabled in parliament and are open for scrutiny by parliament. Um, in terms of adult prisoners, you've set out some recommendations in your uh, statement. Uh, what sort of work does ALSWA do to support adult prisoners with disability in WA prisons? Sadly, sadly not a lot. Um, we're a legal service and our, our remit, if you like, is the provision of legal services to our clients. So in the criminal law domain in particular, we will be dealing with clients on remand. Um, we will do our best to try and assist them. We've got a bail support service, which is focused on getting people out of custody. But in terms of providing practical assistance to adult prisoners on remand, our capacity is very limited. When it comes to the client cohort who are sentenced, to terms of immediate imprisonment and they go to jail, our role is almost non-existent because we'll do the work in court, but post-sentence, we don't have any real capacity or resources to be able to provide consistent ongoing assistance to our clients. And the biggest Group in all of those are clients in jail with disabilities. Unless it's so no, no equivalent to the youth. Sorry, Ms. Carter. Sorry, I just thought I'd just add that unless it's in relation to complaints about the conditions, because then yeah. my team assists with that. And we have many, many men who experience trauma in Bankshire Hill who are now experiencing <coughs> isolation and confinement and more trauma in adult prisons. Um, and you've provided to the Royal Commission letters you've written to the Director of Health Services uh, requesting support such as adequate medical treatment uh, for clients. Yes, both mental health treatment and physical health treatment. We've written many, many letters, appro approximately about one a week. Um, we would normally write. Um, and uh, you've also mentioned that a matter of grave concern is the heat conditions at the Roeburn Regional Prison uh, where you've drawn attention to the inspectors reports over about 20 years uh, drawing attention to uh, the very high temperatures over summer and the lack of effective uh, heat control, climate control. Yes, that's prison. right. In temperatures in Roeburn town have been known to be over 50 degrees Celsius. And in the actual cells at Roeburn prison, they've been much higher than that in the mid 50 degrees Celsius. And there's no air conditioning for the men. There is air conditioning in the women's cells and there was air conditioning installed a couple of years ago in the staff toilets. Um, Mr. Collins, in terms of adult prisons, you've expressed concerns about the high risk uh, offender legislation earlier in your evidence. Um, 
I wonder if you could outline the nature of your concerns and how they affect in particular people with disabilities. I can, thank you. Um, I, I think one of the primary issues for me is that the high risk serious offender legislation superseded the Dangerous Sex Offender Act in Western Australia. And the new legislation widens the scope of the sorts of offences which can be the subject of a high risk serious offender application very considerably. So whilst under the Dangerous Sex Offender Act, applications could be only made in relation to the commission of serious sexual offences, both involving sexual violence and serious sexual offending against children. The new act enables applications to be made in relation to offences of violence, murder and manslaughter and so on, which is understandable, but it also includes offences such as lighting or attempting to light a fire likely to injure, an act or omission causing bodily harm or where the health safety of someone will be endangered. So that would involve someone, for example, throwing a rock at another person and missing. It also includes deprivation of liberty, stalking, robbery, assault with intent to rob, breach of duty of person in control of ignition source or fire, and criminal damage by fire, which of course in a practical setting may, and we have a lot of clients who are charged with criminal damage by fire where they've set fire to a wheelie bin. And that offence will be dealt with in the district court, punishable life by maximum of life imprisonment. So that's part of it. So there's a wide scope of potential offences that can be the subject of applications. But the, the issue is very acute for Aboriginal prisoners because self-evidently Aboriginal prisoners come from backgrounds of considerable disadvantage and dysfunction. They have trauma histories. They end up in jail. They don't have access to any programs whilst on remand and their ability to participate in rehabilitative courses and such like while serving sentences of imprisonment is very limited. They don't have the skills or the wherewithal to be able to actually enrol. And because the courses are often not culturally specific or by dint of their disability, they do not have, if they do enrol, the capacity to complete them satisfactorily. So that means having not completed the programs that they have been expected to complete, they will be denied parole if they apply for it. That means that they then complete the entirety of their sentence or those many, I should say, simply do not <coughs> seek to be released on parole and complete the entirety of their sentences. Those sorts of prisoners serving, offense, serving sentences for serious offending uh, often have multiple prior convictions for serious offences. They are the perfect candidate for a dangerous sex offender application and I am unaware of any Aboriginal person, the subject of an application who has avoided either a custody order or a supervision order. So as far as I'm aware, every single Aboriginal prisoner who's been the subject of an application under the Dangerous Sex Offender Act has had, sorry, High Risk Serious Offender Act has had an order made against them. And of course, a custody order has the potential to be a form of indefinite imprisonment. So Ms. there's- Ms. Wright, I, yeah. we've been going for yes. two hours. Yes. How long are you likely to be? Uh, I'm finished. <laughs> uh, I had one more question. But right, well, I, I'll ask uh, one more question. I just think people may need a bit of a yes, break. Yes, yes. Uh, 
to be clear, Mr. Collins, the Act provides for both detention orders and supervision orders. And the, I just wanted to ask you, in terms of the supervision orders, for people with disabilities that in, might include a cognitive disability, have you made any observations about their ability to comply with the conditions to which the supervision order is subject, or is that a matter which in your experience is taken into account by the court when it um, determines the conditions uh, to which the person will be subject? Well, the, 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 act is, the Act is structured so that it's, it's nigh on mandatory that a raft of conditions would be attached to a supervision order. In the normal course of events, uh, there are north of 50 conditions attached to supervision orders. Uh, most of the Aboriginal people with disabilities on such orders are comprehensively incapable of complying with them. They, um, with ALS acted for a client, we didn't appear at the um, High Risk Serious Offender Act application, but we acted for him during the course of his criminal proceedings. He got a, a supervision order. He was on, on the brink of wanting to take his own life because the, the number and the nature, onerous nature of the conditions were such that he couldn't cope. And I heard the other day that another Aboriginal person on a supervision order took his own life because of what was expected of him on the order. Um, could I thank you all? They're my questions, Chair. Sure. Um, I'll ask uh, my colleagues, if I may, if they have uh, uh, questions, uh, if we can just keep them reasonably brief because of the time. Yes, uh, first, uh, Commissioner Mason. Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't have uh, any questions. Um, I think the information um, and your statement is very comprehensive. So thank you very much for your evidence today. I just want to say one thing for First Nations people following this hearing, hearing this evidence, particularly the evidence that has been presented this morning. Um, Professor Megan Davis, who uh, largely wrote the Uluru Statement from the Heart, talked about that uh, Aboriginal people are the um, highest incarcerated people on the planet. And you talked about Western Australia being the highest, one in 15 Aboriginal men in custody um, as we speak. Just wanted to say that um, Professor Megan Davis said um, in an interview yesterday that law reform is about knowing there can be a better day and it just um, shines a lot on the work of this Royal Commission, how important our work is in relation to First Nations people, men and women and young people, children with disability in prisons across Australia today. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Mason. Uh, Commissioner McEwen, do you have any questions? Uh, thank you. I, I do have one question. Firstly, thank you uh, to th the three of you. The question I have is for any or all of you is, you mentioned at some point your access to the clients and the people in the prisons. For example, Mr. Collins, you said you had maximum one hour with your client yesterday. Just more broadly, how would you describe the ease or not of the access that you have to your client? Is it straightforward or is it problematical? If they call you, can you be there quickly? How would you describe broadly and in the limited time we have the access? It really depends on the different prison. So Unit you know, 18 is particularly bad because the adult prisoners need to have their time in the social visits. So that one hour is between 8.45 and 9.45 a.m. each weekday. It's very difficult for us to get all the way down to Katarina Prison. It's very difficult for families as well. Um, Bankshire is normally pretty good at making sure that we can get in to see our clients. The other prisons are usually pretty um, easy to get into to book in-person visits. Telephone calls, on the other hand, can be quite difficult. I know that adults can press a button to ring the ALS at um, the times when they're allowed to access the phone. And we have a lot of phone calls from them. The children in Bankshire and at Unit 18, I've been told, cannot call through to the ALS very easily at all. So they have to wait for us to go and visit them to then report any concerns. So it, it depends. In some cases, it's easier than others. Thank you. Did anyone else want to add? 
No, thank you. Yeah. Do you mind, Ms. Greenock, I know, uh, you also try and refer pe people. How, how, what kind of access do they have more broadly to non-legal services? You talked briefly at the beginning about you, you try to refer people and connect people. Can you briefly describe how that is in practice and how easy that is? In practice at Bankshire Hill Detention Centre? Yeah, or, yes. Um, in yeah. general? To be honest, it's we have days where we're challenged. Um, sometimes we get told by different departmental places such as the Mental Health Commission or Education or Housing that our client is too complex. So all depends on the individual themselves. Um, I know that sometimes we can gain, uh, these young people can gain access and be referred to other services. Um, it all depends on the individual themselves. So sometimes it can be challenging and then sometimes it can be quite easy to do the referral. Um, thank you and thank you again. Yes, I too would like to thank you for your evidence. Um, at times it's been uh, graphic. It's not easy to listen to um, and it's very important evidence uh, for us uh, in dealing with the issues that have been uh, identified at this hearing and at other hearings and of course uh, with other inquiries. Uh, however, uh, it, uh, we have been assisted also by the suggestions you've made for change um, and uh, they're also very important suggestions which will be very helpful to us in formulating uh, recommendations to address the issues that have been identified. So thank you very much for the thoughtfulness uh, with which you've approached giving your evidence, both in your written statement and the oral evidence today. We're very grateful to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Wright, uh, it's now uh, just after eight minutes past 11 uh, in Perth, uh, should we adjourn until uh, 25 past? Uh, yes. Yes, all right. Well, we'll adjourn until 11.25 uh, Perth time, 1.25 Sydney time. The Royal Commission is now adjourned. The Royal Commission is now in session. Yes, uh, Ms. Wright. Um, commissioners, you'll now be hearing from Mr. Eamon Ryan, uh, the Inspector of Custodial Services of Western Australia. And his statement is found at Tender Bundle C.1, Tab 1. Uh, past reports of the Inspector and of his predecessor in so far as relevant are found in Tender Bundle D. And I'll be referring to some of that material during uh, Mr. Ryan's evidence. I understand he will take an oath. Yes. Mr. Ryan, thank you very much uh, for the uh, detailed response uh, you have provided to uh, the uh, notice to give information. We've got that document and we have, uh, of course, read it. And thank you also for coming to the Royal Commission in Perth uh, to give evidence today. Uh, just to indicate where everybody is, uh, Commissioner McEwen is uh, with you in the same hearing room. Commissioner Mason is located in Brisbane and appears on the screen. I am in the Sydney hearing room and uh, Ms Wright is also in the Sydney hearing room. So we are somewhat scattered, but the technology has been working uh, remarkably well. So hopefully all will proceed smoothly. If you would be good enough to follow the instructions of uh, Commissioner Mason's associate, she will administer the oath to you. I will read you the oath. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. 
Thank you, Mr. Ryan. I'll now ask uh, Ms. Wright to ask you some questions. Uh, Mr. Ryan, uh, first, if you could state your name. Oh, Mr. Ryan, yes. For the record. Eamon Francis Ryan. And you are the Inspector Custodial Services of Western Australia? That's correct. Uh, you were appointed in May 2019 for a term of five years. Yes. What's your professional background, just briefly? I have a background in governance and compliance. Um, prior to being appointed to this role, I was the Executive Director of Integrity, Integrity and Risk with the Public Sector Commission in Western Australia. And prior to that, I was the Executive Director of Professional Standards and Conduct with the Department of Education in Western Australia for a period of 10 years. And you hold your current position under the uh, Inspector of Custodial Services Act 2003 of Western Australia? That's correct, yes. And that enabling legislation requires you to inspect every prison and detention centre in Western Australia, among other places, at least once every three years? That's correct. And what does an inspection typically entail? Is it a single visit or something that's conducted over time? Well, the actual statutory inspections that you refer to are um, a single visit, and that would be over a period of several days or um, possibly even over several weeks. Um, <laughs> the inspection process, if you'd like me to briefly outline it for you. Um, Just briefly, thank you. It's quite comprehensive. Um, we announced the inspection several months before the site component, we gather a, a range of documentation uh, from the department and from the facility. We undertake surveys of staff and uh, prisoners or detainees. We conduct service provider meetings. So all of those NGOs that visit the prison to provide services, we meet with them. And then there's a lot of work and preparation and analysis and planning before the actual site visit. During the site visit of the inspection, we meet with um, the, the senior management team. We meet with officers, we meet with health staff, uh, program staff, we meet with prisoners, we hold focus groups and forums uh, and gather a range of information. And then we, we, want, we move from each unit to the, uh, to the various workplaces and just have informal interactions and conversations with, with prisoners and with uh, the staff. But from that, we um, prepare some uh, review notes and we will pre pre prepare a debriefing, which I deliver back to the prison, to the staff, and a copy of that goes to the commissioner and the director general and the minister and the um, parliament parliamentary uh, public administration committee. We then go away and do an enormous amount of analysis to prepare our draft inspection report, which is provided to the department that's required uh, under section 37 of the act. The department's given an opportunity to, to respond to the draft report and the proposed recommendations. And then once that's received, the report's finalised and it's um, delivered by me to the speaker and the president of the respective houses, where it sits for 30 days before it's actually tabled and published. As part of your answer, you said that you identify detainees to speak to, and then you referred to also speaking to them informally when you are in the detention centre or prison, I take it. Yes. How do you identify the detainees to speak to? Okay, so there would be groups that we would ordinarily uh, speak to and meet with, and that might be, for example, Aboriginal prisoners. It might be out of country prisoners. It might be foreign national prisoners. Um, we will usually meet with peer support prisoners. Um, or prisoners who are involved in some sort of consultative councils. So they're the kinds of generic groups we would, we would meet with. But we also, if we have particular concerns about an issue within a facility, our staff have access to the department's uh, total offender management system or TOM system. So we can look at and, and put together lists of prisoners that we want to speak to who may have a particular um, uh, category. For example, it could be prisoners with disability who are, who are flagged as having a disability, and then we'll arrange to have particular meetings with them, or we may go and seek them out in their workplace or in their, in their accommodation unit. Has that ever occurred, that you have identified uh, prisoners to speak to by reason of the fact they have disability? In other words, you've wanted to hear from uh, people with disability who are in prisons or detention centres? 
Um, I would say not, in, well, certainly in my time, not specifically a group of prisoners with disability, but we would, um, through our engagement with the other prisoner groups, particularly Aboriginal prisoners, we will come into contact with and meet with uh, prisoners with disability. Um, I, it's often been my experience that just in walking around the units, we will come across prisoners, particularly with a cognitive impairment, and we will informally interact with them um, and often talk to their peers and their peer colleagues, their prisoner colleagues, about how they're, well, how they're uh, taken care of and how they're looked after and that kind of thing. And are there any arrangements uh, to ensure that prisoners and detainees are able to speak to you uh, confidentially and without fear of retribution or other consequences? Yes, well, our, our office has been established now for 20 years in Western Australia and, and the, the, we have free and unfettered access and that's well understood in the, in the prison system. So the only time there would be a restriction on us uh, accessing a prisoner or being able to speak confidentially with them would be if there is a particular security risk factor involved. And that might, you know, for example, uh, in the Casharina prison, there is a, a unit called the Special Handling Unit uh, where particularly... Um, dangerous or volatile prisoners are held, we would still have full access to that unit, but we might speak to the prisoner through, through the door or we might speak to them in a, in a common area where custodial staff are present to provide a, a safety barrier, but they're a sufficient distance, distance so we're, we are able to have a, a conversation. Um, I have experienced no um, barriers to confidentially speaking to prisoners or, or staff for that matter. Now, in addition to the inspection function, you have a power under the legislation to review a custodial service. I just wanted to ask you about that. That's okay. defined to include um, the management control or security um, of the prison um, or the security control, safety care or welfare of prisoners. So you seem to have power to specifically consider safety, I'm sorry, care or welfare of prisoners. And it can even include a review in relation to particular prisoners or detainees. Um, now, does that power, is that an adjunct to your inspection power or part of uh, what you do as part of an inspection? And does it mean in principle that if you were to hear that the treatment and conditions for prisoners, say, with disability were compromised in a particular custodial setting or there was a particular issue across custodial settings affecting people with disability, um, that you could conduct a, a, a review, uh, a particular review, uh, yes, looking at disability issues? Yes, it does. So the, the review function um, is a separate function. It's a separate team within within our office, um, and and very simply, it's it's the it's the the power to undertake thematic reviews. The catalyst might be as as your question prompted, uh, particular concerns about a, a particular individual or groups of individuals, and I can give you some examples of the sorts of reviews we've done that have been prompted by that. Uh, my predecessor. Um, undertook a review and published a report into prisoners' access to secure mental health. That was prompted by concerns uh, about the treatment of two particular uh, prisoners who were transferred to the, the state psychi secure psychiatric hospital. Um, so that those particular instances were the catalyst to prompt the, the wider review. And we've also done reviews and published more recently into, for example, smoking, into older prisoners, uh, into prisoners, um, the, the care and management of prisoners requiring protection. Um, they're not specifically disability focused topics per se, but there's a high incidence of prisoners with disability, particularly cognitive or neurodevelopmental disability in those cohorts of prisoners. Yes, um, we heard some evidence this morning um, from a practitioner that he's told by kids in detention, they can't understand the education because of a language barrier. And uh, his view that there should be screening for hearing, for example, given the high prevalence of hearing impairments in Aboriginal uh, First Nations young people. So in theory, I'm not suggesting that you need to do this sort of review, but in theory, 
under the Act you could conduct a thematic review into that kind of issue, for example, screening um, of young people uh, for hearing or whether uh, there is adequate access to education uh, for young people for whom English is not a first language. Yeah, yeah yes, absolutely. Um, our planning process for our review has um, um, a reasonably long list of potential topics and one of them is um, around screening for hearing or for hearing loss or for hearing impairment. Um, it's not something that we have directly on our radar in our immediate uh, work, work plan, but it's certainly one of those topics that uh, is, is um, on our radar for the medium term. And what is your capacity to deal with individual complaints? Um, if you receive a complaint, for example, from a person with disability about something that might concern their disability support needs in custody, uh, your reviews being more systemic, looking at systemic issues, how do you deal with individual complaints? Okay, so where we, we uh, our act is very specific, we can receive complaints, but we can't act on them. So we don't, we don't resolve the complaints. So if I was to receive a complaint of the nature posed in your question, um, there would be a number of options available to me under, the, under my act. And that would be the, the obvious one would be to refer them to the Health Complaints Commission. Uh, the Health and Disability Complaints Office in Western Australia, and they're co-located in the same building as us, so we have a good relationship with them. I could also refer the complaint to the Ombudsman if it was a matter of administration, but I can also use the complaint to inform the work of our office. So I could use the complaint as a catalyst to look at, for, as you suggested, um, access to hearing assessments and, and that kind of thing. So there's, there's a multitude of what I can do, but I can't actually deal with the complaint itself as to determine the merits of it one way or the other. Um, your office has a code of inspection standards for adult custodial services. Yes, it does. And there's also a code of inspection standards applicable to youth justice. That's correct. Um, you're not the author of either of those codes. The revised code, code of inspection standards um, were produced um, in, during my ten, tenure. Um, we coordinated the project. Uh, I won't claim that it's all my work. I've got a, a team of very capable people in the office who, who worked on that, but that was published in my tenure. So that was a review of the existing standards benchmarked against national and international and uh, international human rights uh, standards. Uh, and then we publish it. It looks very different to the previous ones. And we're, we've just commenced a, a similar exercise in, re in respect of the youth justice standards. So um, th they are qu uh, quite dated and now um, and we're, we're commencing that work. Um, at the, it's, it's in the very early stages. Um, commissioners, just for your information, the code for inspection standards for adults is found at Tender Bundle D, tab eight. Um, now that code, uh, the revised code of inspection standards for adult custodial services, as you say, refers to a number of international treaties and conventions, including the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and includes a section, part six, relates to disability, starting at page 68. And it contains, um, um, as you obviously be familiar, Mr. Ryan, components that deal really with all aspects of the custodial experience for prisoners with disability, from screening to duty of care, a bullying, requests and complaint, accommodation and disciplinary procedures, uh, daily life, health and support, uh, security and rehabilitation and reparation. Um, it seems to deal with the standards which you, um, well, your office expects the uh, prisons to apply uh, rather than perhaps as the title suggests, the standards which um, your office applies in conducting the inspection. In other words, it's the things you look for in the prisons um, that they should be complying with. Yes, that's correct. But so you see that the way that standards are structured, um, they largely follow the prisoner's journey from um, arrival at the prison through to you know day-to-day -day living, and in this particular case, 
you, on the screen is early days in custody. And the objective is that there's, it sets a standard that, that we expect the prison to meet. Um, and we, when we do our inspection work, that's the fundamental basis upon which we measure the performance of the prison back to that standard. Um, so it's, um, in, in a sense, it's a, it's a, it's a combination of both um, propositions put in your question. It is the standard we use to for our inspections, but it is also the standard that we expect to see delivered in the prisons. Um, and it's not prescriptive, it, they're more rights-based standards and the prison can meet those standards in many different ways, not just in the, in the, the measures that we've identified, which are the most common measures. Um, you know, the standard can be met by providing a different service in a different way that still meets that fundamental standard. But you do actually apply those codes, do you, in conducting your inspections? They're not merely aspirational, they are a benchmarking tool for yeah. you? Yes, when we, when we do our inspection planning document, the individual officers will be allocated um, particular functional areas um, and also spatial areas within the prison. And when they're preparing their uh, planning documentation and notes, they always refer back to the standard that's applicable to that particular area of their, of their focus. Okay. And you've said that the uh, youth justice equivalent document is under review. That's is correct. that right? Yes. Um, and do, is there a particular time frame for that to be completed? Um, well, it, it is, is it, it's a body of work that we're doing in addition to our standard inspection work and our standard review work. So um, I would hope that it would be finished within the next 12 months, but um, I don't uh, at the moment have a, a set deadline. Um, it, it is just one of those, one of the many things that we're, we're trying to do. And it, now that we've started it, we, it, it just won't, won't be something that will um, uh, be allowed to wither, it'll, it'll be something we'll push along with. I'm certainly not suggesting you're not working hard enough. Um, the reason for my question was really that um, the department's talking about a new operating uh, philosophy and uh, your standards seem to be quite a good starting point for benchmarking uh, any new operating philosophy, which would include a trauma-informed approach which has been urged on government uh, for the better part of a decade. Um, would you agree that the codes uh, are relevant in that uh, yeah. exercise? Yes, if you look through the, um, the uh, and I presume you're talking about now in the, in the youth space, um, yeah, the, um, the, the, even the, the old youth, justice stand, youth uh, custodial standards will regularly refer to a trauma-informed model of care or, or a trauma-informed practice or a practice that takes into account the existence of trauma and, um, and disability and, and those sorts of factors. So yes, uh, uh, your question is, are they relevant to the development of a, an operational model? Yes. And for your future inspections um, in determining whether the new operating philosophy is addressing the concerns which you've expressed in your most recent report about Banksia Hill? Yes, but I think the, the operating philosophy um, will, will be different to the, the inspection standards. Um, you know, our revised inspection standards uh, for youth will, uh, will, will look and feel very similar to the revised adult standards. Um, but I think the operating philosophy and the operating model will be the method or the, the, the system level approach that the, that the Department and the Justice and the Department of Justice and the, and the Detention Centre will take in trying to meet those standards. They, they yeah. don't necessarily um, one precede the other. Um, in terms of youth justice, uh, Banksia Hill um, is a centre which is 20 kilometres south of Perth. Is that right? Uh, give or take, yes. And it's um, been the state's only juvenile detention centre since 2012? That's correct. Um, it opened in 1997 and was amalgamated in 2012 with a remand centre. That's correct. And uh, since that time, it's housed all male and female uh, detainees, both sentenced and remand from 10 to 18 years of age and from every part of the state. 
That's correct, yes. And uh, that approach is unique in Australia? I think Western Australia, with the exception of perhaps the ACT, um, I think Western Australia is the only state with a single facility for youth detention. In terms of 10 year olds, do you know if there are any 10 year old children currently detained in Banksia Hill? Um, I do have that number here. I'm pretty sure the answer is no, but if you'll just permit me, I can, um, I can be certain. Certainly. Okay, so the data that I have is, is um, data that was prepared for me on the 21st of September and the breakdown of age. Um, the youngest child in detention is 13 years old. And there are nine children who are 13 years old and they're the youngest. Uh, and as far as children at the unit 18, um, just for answering the next question, the, the youngest is 14 and there are two children who are 14. At, at, as at that date. Um, do you make any, I mean, obviously the population would change over time, do you make any particular effort to see uh, from the younger cohort of children from 10 up? Um, I'm sorry, could you clarify? I'm not sure what question. When, when you're conducting an inspection and seeking to hear from uh, children and young people at Banksy Hill, do you make any particular effort to hear from the younger cohort, whether it be 10 year olds or 11 year olds, uh, if yes. indeed present? Do you, do you inform yourself as to whether there are younger children there and do you seek to see those children? Yes, yes. There's a, um, um, a, a case not that long ago where there was a, a person who was age 10 was in detention and we made a particular point to um, not during an inspection outside of an inspection to make several visits to the facility to meet and speak with that person and to speak with the staff and the multidisciplinary team that were managing the care of that person to satisfy ourselves that the care was um, as good as it can be for a 10 year old in prison. Is there any separation of the children at the lower end of the age range from the older children? My understanding is that, that um, certainly at that point, they did try to accommodate uh, younger children together um, or with more stable, sort of slightly older children. I understand, and I'm going from memory, so please don't hold me to this, but I understand that in the past, very young children may have been held in the girls' unit Yida as well, but um, that's just a recollection. I, I, I can't point you to a, a fact on that. I'm sorry. Well, the children, adolescents and young adults have vastly different levels of physical and intellectual and emotional development. So it would be important, wouldn't it, that they weren't all in the one place? Yes, absolutely. Um, you, um, in the one unit or in the one facility? Well, in the one physical space, whether that be a unit or a unit within a unit, um, that they're physically separated, is that important? Absolutely, yes. You would, you would, you wouldn't want a ten or eleven year old in a unit in the same unit um, and accessible by a, a seventeen or eighteen year old person um, for obvious reasons. And is it part of your role to check that that's not occurring? <laughs> Well, that would be something we would not go to specifically address, but it's something that we would look at during the course of our inspection, you know, who's accommodated in which unit and, and, and whether those sorts of factors are being taken into consideration. But I, I, I'd have to say I haven't got um, specific concerns that we've identified or that have been raised with us that that is a particular issue, that you have a 10-year-old in the same unit as an 18-year-old or 17-year-old. The, the, the centre usually addresses that reasonably well. Now, since you commenced in May 2019, uh, have you issued two reports about Banksia Hill? Yes. One in April 2021, and that was report 135, and one in March of this year, and that was report 141. Yes, that's correct. And uh, your predecessor, 
Neil Morgan issued uh, reports uh, and from 2013, he issued reports in 2013, 2015, 2017 and 2018 about Banksia Hill Detention Centre. Yes. That's, 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 You're familiar with, generally, yes. with that fact. Yes, generally. Um, and uh, it's fair to say that you've raised similar issues uh, in your reports as he had raised in yes. terms of the absence of a effective operating philosophy or indeed any cohesive operating philosophy at the detention centre. Yes, that's, that's correct. Um, in, in my preparation for this appearance today, um, I went back and, and read some of the overviews of those uh, older reports. And there's a, a striking similarity to the work that we did in uh, report 135 and 141. And the conclusion you've reached in your latest report is that Banksia Hill Detention Centre is not fit for purpose as a youth, youth uh, detention centre. And you've said it looks like, and in many respects runs like, an adult prison. Yes, that's great. Even to the point where there are adult prison officers stationed there to assist in maintaining order and security, and someone's hopefully bringing that up on screen. Yes. Um, and even to the point where there are adult prison officers stationed there, and you've referred to staff shortages and the deployment of response teams from the department's special operations group. Um, you said in that report uh, at page Roman numeral four that many of the young people have significant impairments, uh, traumatic backgrounds uh, of abuse and neglect and uh, diagnosed complex neurological disorders. That's towards the bottom of uh, page Roman numeral four. And you went on to say, this tells us that the management and care of these children must be trauma informed and evidence based, with at the very least an equal focus on welfare needs alongside custodial needs. Yes, that's correct. Um, so coming, coming back then to your final conclusion, it's not fit for purpose. Um, they're, they're plain English words, but can you elaborate on what you mean by that specifically? Well, I, I guess what I'm saying there is that um, the one history has shown that the amalgamation of the two facilities, the remand facility and the, bank, and the sentence facility into one hasn't been a success. Um, the absence of a trauma-informed model of care um, is a critical factor. The uh, focus, and, and, and I don't make light, much as the witness prior to me, I don't make light of the need to maintain the safety of the staff and the, and the security of the facility. But um, the views expressed in our report 141 is that that can, ought to be addressed with equal priority to welfare, a welfare-focused, trauma-informed operating model of care. I don't think one is a precursor to the other or one needs to uh, precede the other. I think both, and I say this in the report, I think both need to be implemented hand-in-hand uh, -hand at the same time. Because you can't have an effective trauma-informed approach unless everyone's safe. That's correct, yes. That's simple putting it simplistically, but essentially safety is important for that reason. Mm -hmm. um, but in saying it's not fit for purpose, you're not, you're not just referring to matters of infrastructure or physical environment, although is that included in your conclusion? You're referring to workforce and training and the lack of an overarching rehabilitation focus for kids? Yes, it's, it's all of those things. It's the um, focus on, on security, on hardening the regime, anti-climb fences, barrier, barrier management, 
security focus, um, staff presence. It is those things, and it is also the absence of that welfare focused trauma informed practice. Um, my view is that the welfare focused trauma informed practice is the means by which you, you ensure the safety and security of the facility. And uh, in other words, if kids were properly supported in the most healing environment, therapeutic environment possible, uh, there may not be uh, such significant safety concerns arising from critical incidents? That's my view. Is that yeah. what you mean? Uh, the experience has shown, um, and again, um, I don't have data on this, but, but experience and certainly from the people I've spoken to in recent weeks, um, we can't identify or recall a, a situation where the children at Banksia Hill who were acting out were abusive uh, or uh, assaulting or intimidating a non-custodial staff member. So um, my experience in talking to uh, young people in detention is that they're they were respectful and that's been the experience of my staff and that's been the experience of staff of other agencies and um, shall we call them civilian staff within uh, the custodial setting. Could I just take that further? When you refer to the custodial staff, you're referring to predominantly the youth custodial officers. Um, are they the staff that have most contact with the young people? Yes, yes, I, that, the answer is yes to both of those. And most of the critical incidents arise from uh, uh, assaults or um, actions which are perceived as behaviour directed to youth custodial officers by the young people? Directed to or at or in defiance of or resistant to what the youth custodial officers are wanting them to do to do. For example, um, at a particular time, there might be six or eight um, young people out of, out of in the wing of an accommodation unit. The youth custodial officers may come to them and say, right, it's 4.30, you have to go back into your cells. And then there's a reaction to that. Now, the, the, the focus point of that reaction is the youth custodial officers and that, that's where the conflict arises. So how important are those staff members to the successful implementation of a more rehabilitative approach and a new philosophy? Are they they're critical, are they not? Well, absolutely, yes. Um, and uh, do you look at the training that they receive in disability awareness as my part of your job? Yes, my understanding is that the, the training that youth custodial officers get is part of their basic training, their um, initial officer training, um, and they do have training on um, disability and the natures and forms of disability. But beyond that, I don't think there's any particular um, ongoing in-service training, um, you know, to, to build on those uh, foundation blocks. What, what you've said is consistent with the, what the Royal Commission's been told uh, by the Department of Justice, that is, they receive three hours of disability awareness training at the Corrective Services Academy, and a component of that is communication strategies, um, but not necessarily ongoing training or specific training in how to uh, interact with a young person who uh, may have a communication deficit arising from a disability, uh, which might not be obvious and the behavior might look defiant and how to deal with that um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, no, no one's suggesting it would be simple, but um, there needs to be training and ongoing training in managing um, that sort of situation. Um, your, your code um, of inspection standards um, specifically deals with that and says there needs to be ongoing training in managing uh, specific disabilities. Yes, that's correct. Um, and is it your position that 
uh, well, I'll, I'll come back to that. In terms of the new operating philosophy, you haven't made any specific recommendation about what that should look like or how it should be implemented. Um, can you tell the commissioners uh, your view, if any, about what the new operating uh, philosophy should seek to implement? What are the elements of it? Um, we haven't been prescriptive um, for um, a particular, a specific reason, and that is um, we don't want to stray into the executive uh, function of determining how to run a, a detention centre. That would, I think, uh, place us in, co in uh, conflict with our independence. But we have stated that there should be a trauma-informed operating model of care. This is not a new model. This is not a new idea. It's something we've been advocating for for some time. It's something that in following this commission, many of your witnesses who preceded me have ad advocated for. And in essence, uh, and I, I don't profess to be an expert or a psychologist, but in, in essence, it's a model of care that is centered around uh, a trauma-informed practice. So all of the staff have to fundamentally understand trauma, trauma in themselves, trauma in the people they're dealing with, um, understand the, how that will um, impact on the person's response, and, the person, and, and what, how it, it will trigger the, the individual's response. It would require a, an understanding of the individual's trauma. So um, as the witness before me um, outlined in quite harrowing detail, the trauma experienced by one person, um, and having a deep understanding of, of the people managing that person of that trauma um, is, is essential. You, you cannot manage a young person like that in the way that you would manage uh, a similar aged, uh, well-functioning, well-adjusted uh, teenager who's just defiant that they they want to go to the party and you're not going to let them. The, the fundamentally different approach. Um, is that partly behind one of the two recommendations that you did make in report 141, which was, um, to embed an additional welfare focused non-custodial work workforce to supplement the existing workforce um, and there you were talking about the ISU yes that's um, right. yeah is that one component of a new operating philosophy that there are more welfare focused staff yes. to give that more attention just to put some context around that recommendation, um, the, the ISU at that point, um, and the report sets it out, was, um, was in a significant crisis. Um, the focus from the department in response to our show cause notice and in response to our report uh, focused almost entirely on security, hardening, increasing the number of custodial staff, extra recruitment, and those sorts of things. So it was, it was a security response. I'm not being critical of that because there were a heightened number of um, critical incidents where staff assaults and those sorts of things. But there were also an increased number of self-harm attempts, suicide attempts, um, and it needed some sort of circuit breaker. That's what that recommendation was focused on. We, you, you, know, you need to do something now. You can't wait six to 12 months to develop an operating model of care and, a, and, and a, get a consultant to do your philosophy and then fund that and train all the staff. It needed something, an immediate, and that's why I've used it, an immediate circuit breaker, something to break the spiral of, that we were seeing in, in, in the centre. And so what you would be expecting then for a circuit breaker is a prompt response by the department to your recommendation? Yes, that's what I'd hoped, yes. Has that occurred? Certainly the immediate circuit breaker um, hasn't been as, as fulsome as, as I would like. Um, the young people that they've, um, the, the situation deteriorated even further to the point where they moved 17 or so young people to Unit 18 at Cash Arena, and that's well documented and the Commission is aware of that. Um, there are additional welfare supports in place at, at Cash Arena. There are mentors from non-government organisations that come in every day. There's additional education resources. 
there's additional uh, psychological resources and uh, case management resources that are in Casuarina. But of course, all of those things only happen when the kids are up and about. So they're, they're out and they're able to participate in education, participate in recreation and, and those counselling sessions. But um, in the time the young people have been at Casuarina, there's been a, con a, a continuation of the critical incidents. There's been a continuation of the self-harm attempts and there's been a continuation of the infrastructure damage and, and assaults on staff. So um, the situation is still very volatile. There are many days where it works very well. Edu the kids get education, they get recreation and time, time out. Um, but there are also days where those, those things don't, don't go so well and, and those um, additional supports um, are not able to, to be uh, provided because there is a, a lockdown. And, and in other words, uh, lockdown where the young people are in their cell by themselves for up to 23 hours and 50 minutes on occasion. Uh, yes, uh, I mean, I can't speak to exactly 23 hours and 50 minutes, but lockdown for long, long periods um, or allowed out for a short period, a small number allowed out for a short period, then they go back and then another smaller number come out. Uh, but well, what, what is the circuit breaker to that situation where uh, the inspector's reports, including your reports, a Supreme Court judge, uh, the lawyers who seek to look after the interests of these children are saying all that lockdown does is cause harm, further harm. And his honour, Justice Toddle said, uh, harm for many years to come. The effect of confining young people in this way is, is harmful. What, what, what is the solution to avoid these excessive repeated lockdowns? Do you have any um, how long suggestions? Um, I, look, I think, I think the solution is um, the, the starting point has to be a trauma-informed operating model of care. We've been talking about that for, for the last 10 years. Um, that's not something that's going to happen um, overnight. That, that's, that's something that has to be thoroughly developed and researched and then staff appropriately trained. Um, I, 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 do, I do think they could do more in, particularly in Unit 18, they could do more by way of bring, bringing in elders and family members um, and, and, and listening to what the young people want. Um, you know, in, we've been out there, or staff from my office have been out to Unit 18 every week since they've gone out there since July. And we were out there on two or three occasions over the last couple of weeks because we were in Casuarina doing an inspection. Um, and we've, we've never had any issues in talking to the young people. Um, they're, they're particularly challenged young people, but they're still young people and, and, and they'll talk to you. They'll treat you, they'll in, interact with you respectfully and quietly. But then of, of my own observation, I've seen them um, and they react. Um, there's an there's a obvious reaction when they're instructed to do something by the uniform staff. So I just think that needs to change. It needs to have a, a very different approach. Um, and I was there recently and, and asked two very senior uniform staff um, at, at, um, responsible for the centre what had been the most effective reform that they had in place. And, and without hesitation, they both said the mentors. The civilian mentors who came and and when I spoke with the mentors, they essentially sit and talk to the kids. They ask them about their life story, ask them about the things they like. They help them if they're doing education. They just talk to them. They play table tennis with them. It's that um, level of interaction. Um, many of the witnesses before me today have spoken of, of those same things. And the, when you say the mentors, is that a specific program, and how is that facilitated? It's a, it's a, it's a um, I guess it's one of the circuit breaker program uh, initiatives that, um, that I recommended in, my, in, the, in report 141. Um, they're from two different community organizations or non-government organizations, um, and they're contracted to come in and provide that service. Um, and, and it is one-on-one, -on -one, one -on two mentoring. Um, there are a range of people with um, 
um, you know, from a variety of backgrounds, whether it's social work background or whether they're just lived experience people, but they're or youth workers or social workers, um, they're just good with young people, um, and they they make a make a huge difference. When you when you're in the unit and you see the young people um, interacting with them, um, it's just a normal interaction between a, an adult uh, and a young person. And uh, so in your recommendation to embed an additional welfare focused workforce, you're referring to mentors. What, what else were you referring to? Well, I think uh, social workers, psychologists, uh, welfare workers, experienced youth justice, uh, youth, um, youth workers, um, the whole range of things, uh, you know, psychiatrists, psychologists, mental health, um, all of those, uh, I, I guess the, the kind of services you would expect uh, that's that's not involved in in custody in you know locking gates lock, locking doors all, all of those welfare supports it would it would include education it would include recreation um, it, it could include a program for example with visiting aunties or uncles um, or community respected community people um, I don't mean you know high profile um, but, you know, footballs or, or footballs or personalities, but um, the, the, the term that we use in our office is mirror models, just average, reasonable people who have may, maybe have even had the same lived experience as the young people who can just sit and talk to them and say, you know, there is a better way, there is hope, that, you know, you, you can have hope and have aspirations, and this is how you get them. So it, um, that's a long answer to a short question. So just to be clear, to your knowledge, the response to the recommendation to in report 141 was to move uh, certain young people perceived as the problematic ones to unit 18, um, but not to embed an additional welfare focused workforce in the ISU and Q unit. Uh, no, there's, I'd have to um, just clarify that, that the, moving the young people from the ISU at Bankshire Hill to Unit 18 was not in response to my report or in response to recommendation two. Um, by the time we finished our report, our, our field work for our report, um, which was which report 141, the situation spiralled even further by way of significant damage that the, that the young people were able to do. They were able to um, damage the infrastructure of the cells to, to an extent that they could breach the wall between one cell and the other, and then breach the, the ceiling space between the cell and the roof, and be, breach the wall between the cell and the common area in the, in the unit. So essentially, they'd be, been able to breach the security, but for all intents and purposes, the, um, the, the officers had lost control to, to keep secured in their cells. So that is a, a, a further um, deterioration or, or downward spiral that happened in between when we published our report and our report was published in April, but our, our field work was pretty much done in January, but it takes some time to produce the report. There'd been a further deterioration and that's when um, they made, made that decision to move the kids to um, Unit 18. And when they did that, they brought those additional um, welfare things that we've been talking about, the psychologist and the mentors um, and, you know, uh, edu ed additional education and, and those services in. And to your knowledge, are they truly additional or are they shared to some extent with Banksia Hill workforce? Oh, oh, definitely some of them are staff that were previously working at Banksia Hill and are now um, stationed at Unit 18. Whether they're stationed at Unit 18 five days a week or they attend you know, for three days or whatever, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but there, also, there have also been um, additional um, resources brought in. But I, but I know from some of the staff that I know, uh, that I'm familiar with, and I've seen them recently at Unit 18, they, they have said to me, I, I come here two days a week and I still do three days a week at Bankshire to provide those sorts of services. Um, now, the, the, your predecessor um, expressed the view uh, that the uh, one-stop shop that is Banksy Hill is uh, a failure, um, and he has he used the word uh, a failure. 
in, uh, I think it was his June 2017 report called Behaviour Management Practices at Banksia Hill. Um, do you have a view about whether um, the use of a single detention centre in Western Australia is appropriate? Um, yes, I do. I, 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 I wouldn't disagree with uh, my predecessor, Professor Morgan, um, for a minute. I think having one facility, um, if, you were stand, if you were starting from, from scratch today, I don't think anyone would design uh, one facility for the entire state of Western Australia. You, you would have multiple facilities that could be um, bro broken up or defined by a range of different criteria. It could be geographically. You, you might have a facility in the Kimberley or in the Pilbara or in the Southwest. It might be by, by age, it might be by gender, um, or it might be by cohort need. So in other words, you might have a, a facility for um, stable, um, settled, sentenced young men and women, where they're able to get uh, improve their education, improve their vocational skills and their employability. You might have a facility with, with, that is intensive for uh, young people with cognitive impairment uh, uh, or other disability, and, and that provides intensive support. So, so there's a range of different options, but I think having um, all of the young people uh, 10 to 17 or 18 males and females remanded and sentenced from all over Western Australia in one place um, has, has, hasn't shown to, to be effective. There is an issue around critical mass. Um, at, at any, you know, the population of Bankshire Hill has been as high as 240 odd. Um, generally at the moment, it's sitting in the 110 um, space. Um, and I can tell you that today, the population in Banks Hill is, is um, 118, I think it is, 118. 87% uh, of those are young men and 13% are women. 61% are on remand and 39% are sentenced. So it, it is a relatively small cohort that if you split it up, um, you, you might not have a critical mass um, but I, I think it would it would operate better than one facility. But also, if it is a single centre, sufficiently small with the numbers you've just provided, that a rehabilitation focus ought be achievable. Yes. Um, you've commented in your report on the cost of. Um, your most recent report, the cost per day of detaining one young person. Um, are you aware of any cost benefit analyses of detention on a therapeutic model versus taking a more punitive approach in the long term? Um, I think it would be a lot more expensive. Um, uh, more expensive. Are there examples in the adult prison setting of therapeutic uh, models which operate successfully that could be a model for youth detention? Um, there are. There, interestingly, 500 metres from Unit 18 at Casuarina is Unit 15, which is what they call the Mali Unit. And that's a therapeutic community within a maximum security adult prison. It's a, um, a drug and al alcohol rehabilitation uh, facility or, or unit. Um, that focuses on, um, operates a, an entirely as a therapeutic community. Um, and we spent some time in there over the last two or three weeks during our Casuarina inspection. Um, and um, it's, it's early days, it's been going for a year or so, maybe 18 months, but it's producing some um, quite significant results. There is a similar um, facility, it's an entire facility at Wandu, uh, rehabilitation, drug and alcohol rehabilitation prison for women. And the whole prison operates as a therapeutic community and it, it's a, a private provider, as is the case in Mali, a private provider uh, comes in and provides that um, intensive therapeutic community model. Um, but the cost per prisoner per day, and, and I can't quote the exact numbers, is significantly higher than the cost per prisoner for a mainstream prisoner. 
Um, so, so that sort of level of intensive support that, that is showing to be effective, um, but it is much more expensive. And children and young people are at a stage of their life where um, that sort of approach would make sense. Yeah, I, I, that's a question I did ask of the people, um, some of the non, the, some of the external providers at when I was at Casuarina. I said, could something like this work for the kids in Unit 18, a therapeutic community model? Um, and the answer was yes and no. Um, yes, in the sense of that wraparound support, that intensive um, nature of welfare support to understand what their needs are, but no in the sense that the therapeutic community at Wandu and at, in the Mallee unit, um, the starting point is you have to volunteer to do it. You have to be, want, you will have to want to do it and you have to want to um, um, address your addiction. So um, if you could have a, a similar um, approach in the, in the youth space, um, I think it would work as effectively but it, it may not be exactly the same in the sense of, uh, um, you know, dealing with addictions. Um, in the first step is, you know, you have to admit that you have an addiction and you want to do something about it. Mm. Getting kids to the point where they sign up for it is the difficulty. Um, it, 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 would, it would be the difficulty, but I'd be very surprised if it actually doesn't turn out to be a quite a simple exercise. Because when you sit with the kids and, and you can... Um, you get through to them and um, perhaps suggest to them that, that they can have a purpose in life, that, that their life doesn't have to repeat their immediate history and their um, people's history. Um, I'd be surprised if there wouldn't be a, a long queue of young people wanting to have a, a chance at a, at a better life. Um, and the question has to be asked, well, why wouldn't the government try given the clear consensus view over many years in the inspector reports and in the wider <clears throat> scientific community that um, this is what is required. Uh, I, I'm not sure I'm the right person to ask that question. No. Um, and just to be clear, the <coughs> operating philosophy which is being urged upon the department goes back to your predecessor's 2013 report, uh, report 85 in 2013, uh, where Mr Morgan said that the vast bulk of the department's budget related to adult offenders and that adult custodial concerns tended to attract the highest attention. And he made uh, recommendations that Bankstead Hill should be, quote, re-engineered so as to reflect a clear and consistent philosophy um, of rehabilitation. And he expanded on what that meant. Um, so it's not new, is it? No, Professor Morgan perhaps may be more eloquent in his expression of that view than I, but um, essentially we're saying the same thing. Not sure about that, but it's it's a consistent theme um, through 2013, 2015, 2017, 2018, and then your reports in 2021 and 2022, all essentially saying the same thing. Um, have you been consulted about the new operating philosophy? We've had two opportunities to be briefed about the work and to provide our thoughts and observations and, and our experience um, to, the, to the consultancy firm that's um, been working on the operating model. Um, we are um, yet to see the final, um, the final product. It's, it's, I think, before the department executive or possibly before government um, so, so I'm not sure what it actually the final um, model will look like. Um, as I said previously, you know, uh, there's a fine balance between us being consulted and being part of the development, because I, I can't be part of the development of, of a model and then have to go and inspect and, and be a critique 
of the of the model if I've been part of the design of it. So um, we've we've been able to provide um, a contribution. You know, there's a stack of reports on the desk desk next to me here um, that we've published, uh, which have, have clearly outlined the, the evidence base for it. Um, I, I, I was grateful to be consulted because I think um, what they're doing and the, and the, the approach, as, as was briefed to us, uh, gave me some confidence as to what they were doing and what and the and the focus. But I haven't seen the detail of it, and as it, as in many of these things, the devil is in the detail, and more importantly, in the um, effectiveness of the implementation and resourcing. Um, Chair, I do have probably at least 10 minutes more to go. I'm conscious of the time. Please continue. Uh, Mr. Ryan, um, the Royal Commission's heard evidence this week about community-based organisations that uh, can support and provide support for detainees and prisoners while they're in uh, custody uh, with regard to their disabilities. Uh, What's the capacity for community-based organisations to come into well, First Banksia Hill, but also adult prisons to uh, provide a positive impact and to um, support people with disabilities? It's a very general question, but... It, it is. I look, I, I think if there's a will, there's a way. I think if there's, um, if there's a level of engagement um, and, you know, it obviously, some of those organisations might be volunteer organisations. Uh, some of it would, would require contracting from the department to those organisations. But it does ha it does happen to an extent now. Um, it happens in the adult uh, st um, uh, estate, and and it happens to an extent in the juvenile estate. So it, it can happen. There are you know it, it's just the logistics of making it happen. Um, but obviously, um, one of the big challenges that Bankshire Hill has faced in recent times has been um, the, the, the staff shortages, the, the absence of custodial staff, um, both through attrition, through workers' compensation, through daily book offs. Um, and for all those things to happen, you need to have custodial staff on hand to, you know, open and close doors to escort people to make sure that. Um, Things are operating uh, in a in a safe way, and people aren't left unduly exposed to um, to risk. So, in other words, for the prison for prisons or the detention centre to, to operate effectively on a daily basis, you need to have a, a minimum number of, of custodial staff present uh, to facilitate all those things. Um, in terms of assessment and screening to identify disability on and after reception to detention or custody. Um, what screening or assessments currently undertaken to identify uh, if a young person has a disability when they enter Banksia Hill or now Unit 18? So- um, Including cognitive impairment. Okay, so entry into, um, the, into detention would be through Banksia Hill. So, so they, don't get off, they don't go from the street to Unit 18 they would be received into Banks Hill. My understanding is that there is a, um, a question and answer, a, a checklist that's undertaken by the custodial officer who is uh, bring, receiving the young person, and that could be from court or from police. Um, um, and and they, go, they go through a series of, of questions. It's, it's like a checklist. I also understand that there is um, within, certainly within the first 12 hours or so, uh, an assessment by a nurse uh, as far as a health assessment. But those assessments are primarily um, around self-disclosure. So in other words, do you have an, an impairment? Do you have a disability? Are you engaged in the NDIA or the NDIS? Are you receiving those services? So it, it relies on a degree of self-disclosure. It will also rely on um, the custodial records held about the individual if they've previously been uh, held in detention or in prison and there is a flag or, a, or some notes already of a of a diagnosis or a, or a concern or a, um, a flag of their disability. Um, but my understanding is that they are not diagnostic in nature. So in the absence of a, a pre-existing diagnosis or in the absence of a, a court-ordered report 
particularly in the context of, of uh, young people coming into detention, the court may order a report, may order a, a psychosocial or a, a, a psychological assessment that involves uh, a diagnosis. Um, in the absence of that, the system, the prison system or the detention system, um, the screening on entry is not diagnostic in nature. Your predecessor said that um, the department does not know how many people in its care have these issues. And there he was referring to a cognitive impairment or behavioural disorder. Um, because the department does not routinely assess young people when they're admitted to custody. Is that still the case? I'd say so, yes. There was some work done by the Telephone Kids Institute um, some years ago. Now it's quite dated, I think, around about 2015, um, but I, I could be wrong, um, but where, they, where they did some uh, assessment of, of the kids in Bankshire Hill and they identified, I think it was 37 odd percent had um, FASD and eight, eight, high 80s percent had some other form of uh, develop, developmental delay or neurodevelopmental condition. But since that time, there hasn't been a comprehensive assessment. I think it would be incredibly valuable for every young person who comes into detention to have that comprehensive diagnostic assessment because it would, it would inform not only their detention, it would form inform their release back into the community. And it actually may impact um, their life going forward because um, my understanding is that for engagement with the NDIS, you need to have a diagnosis. And in the absence of a diagnosis, uh, that's gonna be even more challenging. And how can their disability support needs be properly identified without it? Uh, exactly. Uh, well, you, um, you, you would, you would identify the um, presentations or the manifestations of their underlying disability. And, and in the absence of diagnosis um, for the uninformed or the ill or the undertrained, you may well interpret that as, as wanton defiance or, or willfulness in their behavior, in their behavior response, which again, reverts right back to the point we started on on the trauma informed model of care, a fundamental understanding. If you're going to understand trauma and the drivers of it, you need to understand the un underlying disability that the particular individual may have. Um, so are you, are you critical of the, uh, the current screening processes for identifying disability, at least in the youth justice system? Um, I haven't publicly addressed that in a report. Um, in, in an honest answer to your question, I think it should be diagnostic. Um, I think if you, if you um, it, it shouldn't just try and identify um, pre-existing conditions or, or conditions that you're known about. The, the screening too has a, a very strong focus on um, at-risk identification. So is the person coming in, whether it be a, a young person into detention or a an adult into corrections, is this person a self-harm risk? And if they are, then then that needs to be managed and that needs to be, they need to be placed in a in a in an area where they can be observed or or whatever. Um, Chair, I'm advised that um, if we could have a short adjournment, um, now whether it's in short adjournment or a more lengthy adjournment um, for an issue to be raised. Uh, or issue. Yes, yes. Does that um, mean that uh, it's, a representative wants to raise an issue? Uh, I don't think it's a representative uh, that wants to raise an issue, but it's my council assisting team that would like to raise an issue. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we'll take a short adjournment. Uh, it's now uh, 12... Uh, 40 just after 12:40 perth time so we'll resume at 12:50 perth time unless we have to wait longer i don't i don't believe it will be right, thank you the royal commission is now adjourned
The Royal Commission is now in session. Yes, I'm sorry for that interruption, Mr. Ryan, but uh, we are now back in session. Uh, yes, Ms. Wright. Um, Chair, having had that uh, short adjournment, I have no further questions for uh, the inspector. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'll ask uh, Commissioner Mason whether she has any questions she would like to put to uh, Mr. Ryan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Ryan, were you able to hear the evidence given by Megan Cracker yesterday, or the day before yesterday? I, I was able to hear some of her evidence, but not all of it. Yeah. Um, she mentioned about uh, independent visitors and the numbers of Aboriginal people working in those roles in prisons, and she was saying that it was uh, that that much more uh, needed to be done there in bringing more Aboriginal uh, visitors into prisons, uh, detention. Do you have the same view? And if that's the case, um, what, what strategies are being taken to increase the number? Um, I don't disagree with what um, Ms Cracker said in her evidence. That is a, an area of focus that we have in our inspections, the number of Aboriginal staff, um, and we'll regularly uh, or we'll often make recommendations about prisons and detention centre in increasing the number of Aboriginal staff, particularly in areas like Aboriginal health, work, health workers. Um, as far as the independent visitors, we do have um, a couple of um, our independent vi uh, visitors, our independent volunteers who are Aboriginal. Uh, we've got a couple of others who are um, very familiar with uh, in the Pilbara uh, with um, Aboriginal families and culture. Um, we, we work hard to try and uh, recruit um, Aboriginal people to our uh, independent visitor service, but they are all volunteers um, and um, we, we don't have as many as we would like, but we continue to, to, to try and encourage that. And the kinds of things we do is, is through our engagement with uh, community. For example, when I'm in the, um, in the Pilbara visiting Roban prison, I always go on uh, Nada Media, the local Aboriginal radio station. I always meet with them and we meet with um, community leaders to try and encourage um, community volunteers to step forward um, as to be part of our independent visitor service. Um, but um, I'd take this opportunity to put a, a plug out if there's any uh, Aboriginal people in Western Australia who want to be part of that process. Um, they just need to reach out and contact us. Yeah, it's a difficult task because um, uh, in the document uh, around the revised code of inspection standards, um, it says the number of Aboriginal staff is proportionate to the number of Aboriginal prisoners. That's a that's a tall order. They're aspirational standards, um, and I think it's it's a good aspiration. Yeah. Uh, the. the the other question I had was about the uh, to do with staff, particularly uh, youth custodial officers, uh, around uh, the management of compassion fatigue, burnout, and vicarious trauma. Um, and just if you could give briefly your insights into that. And what strikes me from um, the evidence that you've given today and others this week is that we're talking about a trauma-informed workplace uh, because of the presence of trauma being experienced. Um, in fact, you know, young people, children leaving detention and probably being um, at high levels of trauma as a result of their time in detention. Um, but I was just interested in the staff, because it seems to me there's there's a lot of self-interest in wanting to reduce vicarious trauma and burnout and compassion fatigue for staff working in uh, these closed institutions. Uh, yes, I'd, I'd agree with you entirely. The um, the attrition rate and the and the rates of workers' compensation um, amongst juvenile um, uh, um, youth custodial officers is extraordinarily high and it's one of the con major contributing factors to staff shortages. Um, I, you know, the, the, the um, incidents and the um, history of Bankshire Hill as documented throughout our reports 
uh, it is all a, a history of um, you know one step forward, two steps back of um, of periods of stability and then and then long periods of difficulty with critical incidents and and um, you know self harm attempts, assaults, infrastructure damage. That creates an enormous amount of um, stress and trauma for the workforce. I mean, uh, and I'm not wanting to make light of how difficult their job is. Um, and as you said, you know, they, they suffer, from, they are a traumatized workforce, and that definitely needs to be addressed, if for no other reason other than to retain good people, good hearted people who genuinely want to do that, do, do um, have a welfare focus and make a difference. Um, so it is, it is definitely an issue and it's definitely a challenge. Um, so uh, some work we did some years ago now, I think 2017, about uh, recruitment and retention of Aboriginal staff in the department generally. Um, the department does, the Department of Justice and its corrections, um, does do reasonably well in recruiting um, Aboriginal staff. It's certainly higher than the rate in the public sector. It ought to be much higher. Um, but, but back then, the, one of the big difficulties was retention. Uh, particularly retention of good um, Aboriginal staff, um, it, it, that's an issue, and, and certainly in, in juvenile detention, that's an issue that needs attention. Thank you very much, and thank you for your evidence today. It's a pleasure. <coughs> thank you, Commissioner Mason. I'll ask Commissioner McEwen uh, in Perth if he has any questions for you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ryan, Ryan, for your um, evidence. Just following on from Commissioner Mason's uh, question around workforce, so you've described issues around you know, retention, the high number of um, worker compensation, lack of training for custodial staff. What does that suggest to you or what influences, if any, can you draw from, from that about the culture and leadership of the detention centres we're talking about? Um, I think part of part of the challenge is that um, there is only one place where they can work. So if you're a youth custodial officer, you work in Bankshire Hill, and if if the facility is is constantly in crisis, then um, there is no respite. If you're a prison officer, you can work in facilities all around the state. You can work in maximum security facilities, minimum security prison farms. So, so you have that ability for your career to be different. If you're a youth custodial officer, you don't. So um, effectively, you're in the trenches every day you go to work, and that does have a, a huge uh, impact. Um, as far as leadership, there have been 10 different superintendents at Bankshire Hill in it, over the past 10 years. So that's, um, that's one per year. Now, every one of those has been capable, have, have been um, you know, good people with good, good intentions, um, but, but the things haven't, wor haven't worked out. Um, and I think the underlying issue is the things we've been talking about today, a clear, consistent philosophy. Everybody knows what they're doing. Everybody's on the same page. And there is that level of consistency in approach. And it ought not to make any difference whether you're sitting in the chair of superintendent or I'm sitting in the chair of superintendent or someone else. That's that consistent model gets applied. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Commissioner McEwen. You remember, I think, uh, that there was some evidence given uh, the other day about the decision of Justice uh, Tottle in the Supreme Court and references being made to that today. That case, uh, looking, at, at looking at the judgment, as I and right now, involved uh, an applicant who was detained on remand at Banksia Hill between the 20th of January and the 19th of July 2022. While uh, he was detained there, he was locked in his cell for periods of more than 20 hours and on some days for between 23 and 24 hours, he was 14 years old when he went into the centre at that time, and he turned 15 in March. He applied for a declaration that locking him in his cell on the day specified was unlawful. He was not locked in the cell for any disciplinary reasons, according to the judgment. 
Justice Tottle found that on, um, on my count, on 27 days during that period, this person, this young man of 15, 14 and 15, had been detained unlawfully, 27 separate days. And his honor made a declaration to that effect. That is, the court declares that what happened was unlawful. There was apparently no other relief sorts, for example, damages and so forth. So that was the limit of the judgment. My question to you is what's changed, if anything, and I appreciate that the judgment was delivered only on the 25th of August, but to your knowledge, what has changed since? Um, to my knowledge, nothing has changed. No instructions have been given in consequence of the judgment? Uh, um, I, I, I'm not aware of any. There, there could well have been, um, but I, I'm not aware of any change in the approach. Um, Thank you. You've referred, and uh, the question from Commissioners Mason and McEwen also referred to uh, the difficulties that staff encounter. Uh, and uh, from your description, one can readily see that this is some kind of vicious cycle, uh, that uh, just as uh, the uh, detainees experience abuse and violence and so forth, it must be for many of the workers there a pretty awful experience to have to work there. Um, in your report of 2022 on page three, you record that since January 2021, and I think you were reporting up to September 2021, perhaps November, I'm not sure by memory, from memory, 49 staff members departed Banksia Hill. What was the total workforce, do you know, during that period? Off the top of my head, it's in, of custodial staff, it would be maybe 200. Um, Does it, that imply a, an attrition rate of something like 25%? Yeah, it, it's a significant um, attrition rate. Um, they're, they're, um, they wouldn't be able to, without doing additional schools or you know, training schools, they, they wouldn't be able to keep up with attrition. Uh, which no, is what, yeah. Yeah, no institution can work with a 25% attrition rate, particularly an institution that, as you said, requires consistency of approach and consistency in dealing with the detainees in order to ensure their welfare and for that matter, the welfare of staff. Yes, that's correct. It's, it's had a huge impact. Um, and in addition to that, the, the very, very high rates of workers' compensation uh, as well. So that adds to the, the, the shortages. Um, in our inspection work, we, we often hear about reductions in the daily activities or daily regime due to staff shortages. And, and we often differentiate between the staff shortages by virtue of vacancies, so unfilled positions, or staff shortages by virtue of absence. And, and it's a combination of both here, vacancies by way of the attrition rate and absences by way of workers' compensation or you know, people, the staff just not book, just booking off sick on the particular day in question. All of it has a combat compounding effect on the operation of the facility. This is, this is, this, these are not issues that need or should be determined by questions of cost alone. But having said that, uh, the costs would be curtailed if there weren't these kinds of problems of staff turnover, workers' compensation claims, and the destruction of property that goes along with the behaviours about which we have heard uh, so much, uh, so that uh, there are benefits in a cost sense, in a strict financial cost sense, uh, that would be obtained from doing some of the things that you've suggested in your reports. Would you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. In your report uh, of 2022 on page 11, there's this passage under the heading the ISU, that's the intensive support unit, is progressively becoming a more volatile space. And I'm quoting, the number of incidents occurring in the ISU progressively increased throughout 2021, escalating in October and November. 
of the 3,339 incidents recorded at Banksia Hill in 2021, 41% occurred in the ICU, ISU. 49% of the 254 critical incidents recorded were also located in the ISU. In October 2021, that's one month, 23 of the 25 incidents involving a threat to staff or an actual staff assault were within the ISU. And threats of self-harm, actual incidents of self-harm and suicide attempts within the ISU also increased to its highest levels. Do you have a, <coughs> a view as to the explanation or explanations for this progressive increase of, in <clears throat> the incidents that are recorded in that paragraph? There are many um, facets to, the, to answer that question. The first will be the infrastructure in the ISU is, um, as you will have seen the, the pictures and you will have heard evidence from others, it's stark, it's not therapeutic, um, it's, it, it is, you know, um, it's appalling, to be honest. Um, there aren't facilities for um, any sort of welfare or any sort of therapeutic or calming uh, type environment. Uh, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is that the, the young people are often, as the judgment points out and as our report identified, they're often locked in their cells for long periods, uh, isolated without any sort of uh, human interaction or, or stimulus. Um, and, I, and I'm not being critical of the staff in saying that. I'm not wanting to demonise the youth custodial officers, but that's the reality. And then you uh, overlay on top of that um, the reasons why the young people are moved to the ISU in the first place is um, a critical incident or misbehaviour or, or a, a lack of ability to cope. Um, so all of those things um, result in the ISU being a melting pot. Um, and that's the reason why when we did our inspection, the, the report you're talking about, we focused on the ISU because that's basically where um, all, all of the trouble ends up. Um, and uh, as our report identified, um, it is a spiral. You've, you've used that terminology earlier, uh, Chair. It, it is a spiral. It's a, you know, and, and from this point, it got worse. It got a lot worse from when, when the time we talk about in this report through to July when they made the decision to uh, move a group of young people to Unit 18 at Casharia. Yes, well, together with uh, the paragraph I've just read out, on page eight of your report, you record that there were 24 attempted suicides at Banksia Hill between January and November 2021. Most occurred in September 4, October 15 attempts at suicide and three in November and 83% of the total occurred in the ISU. I'm not sure there's any other word that can be used to describe that as shocking. Yeah, I'd agree with you. And when we look at figure three on page nine, as I read it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that in October and November, there were around, possibly in excess, but around 50, cases of self-harm threats and the same number of self-harm actual. Have I read that correctly? It, that, that is correct. That's what that um, graph represents. Yes, thank you. Uh, Chair, do you mind if I just interrupt quickly and ask one more question? Yes, go Mr. ahead. Yep, thank you. Mr Ryan, going back to that, your information about the high, high rate of workers' compensation, are you aware of what any of the themes from those, uh, what types of worker compensation, um, burnout or psycho psychological distress, anything you can comment on? Um, it is anecdotal, so I have to preface that, but I, my understanding is that the, the large majority are stress-related um, conditions 
there will be an element of um, the slips and falls, particularly from uh, injuries arising from managing critical incidents, you know, restraints and those sorts of things. But there's a there's a high proportion about uh, that are as psychosocial, uh, that that kind of thing. The department would be in much better position to answer that question in detail. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Again, thank you very much for the uh, written statement that you have provided and also for the reports that we have uh, that have been uh, or will be introduced into uh, evidence. Uh, this is very important material for the work of the Royal Commission and indeed uh, for Western Australia uh, because this uh, you are, after all, uh, an officer who is uh, reporting to Western Australian authorities about what is going on in that state and the work that you do is uh, extremely important and so we thank you for the evidence and we thank you for the work that uh, you are doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Ms Wright, does that uh, conclude the proceedings for today? It does, Your Honour. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, in a moment, we'll adjourn, uh, bearing in mind that this is the fourth day of the hearing and there will be a fifth day on the 6th of October, as uh, we have uh, previously mentioned. Um, I do want to thank, however, even though we haven't come to the end of the hearing as such, I do want to thank the witnesses who have give ev given evidence this week in one form or another. Some, of course, have given evidence in person. Some have given evidence through pre-recorded uh, interviews, some through statements. But I do want to thank uh, Nathan uh, for the evidence that he gave through his statement, Tyron Justin, uh, who gave evidence uh, in a pre-record, Ms. Lyons, who gave oral evidence uh, via the link uh, from business, uh, Brisbane, and Alan, who gave pre-recorded uh, evidence. We heard also from uh, Jasmine, who gave oral evidence in person in Perth. Uh, Ms. Cheryl Ellis, who gave oral evidence also in person from Perth. The mother of JC gave evidence via a statement about uh, the experience uh, of uh, her daughter and her death at the hands of police officers. Terry gave oral evidence in person in Perth and submitted a joint written statement with his partner, Cara. And we heard from a number of experts and uh, advocates. We heard from Ms. Tina Powney uh, and uh, Trevor Barker from Galawa, who gave oral evidence in person in Perth. Uh, Ms. Jennifer Cullen, uh, the Chief Executive Officer of Synapse, who uh, gave oral evidence via uh, video link uh, from uh, Brisbane. Ms. Uh, Jody Barney, who's given evidence previously at the Royal Commission and gave further evidence uh, at uh, this hearing. She, of course, is the founder of Deaf Indigenous Community Consultancy, Proprietary Limited. Ms. Megan Krakow from the National Suicide Prevention and Trauma, Trauma Recovery Project, who gave oral evidence uh, in person in Perth. We had the panel discussion yesterday with uh, Ms. Kriti Sharma, the Senior Disability Rights Researcher at Human Rights Watch, Ms. Debbie Kilroy, the Chief Executive Officer of Sisters Inside, and uh, Mr. George Newhouse, the Director and Chief Executive Officer of the National Justice Program. We heard yesterday, uh, sorry, two days ago from, uh, sorry, we heard this morning from Ms. Megan Donohoe uh, the, from the North uh, Australian Aboriginal Justice Agency, NAJA, and she gave oral e evidence via video link from Darwin. We had uh, also today the evidence from uh, Mr. Peter Collins, Ms. Alice Barter, and Ms. Sasha Greenoff from the Aboriginal Legal Service of uh, Western Australia. And uh, we have had a written uh, statement, uh, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll withdraw that. Uh, and we've, heard, of course, heard just now from uh, Mr. Eamon Ryan, the Inspector of Custodial Services, who uh, is the first of uh, governmental institutional witnesses. And we will hear some more governmental witnesses when we resume on the 6th of October. 
I also want to record the appreciation of the commissioners for everybody who's been responsible for organising this hearing. An immense amount of work has been done to prepare for it. A lot of that work has been done in recent uh, times and uh, it is appropriate to express our profound appreciation for all those who have been involved in the process. That includes, of course, uh, Council assisting the Royal Commission, Mr Griffin SC, Ms Wright SC and Ms McMahon, but uh, also the Office of Solicitor assisting and uh, particularly Ms Kate Dobby and her team, the Council and Support uh, uh, branch of uh, or the uh, unit within the Royal Commission that as always uh, does uh, outstanding work. An enormous amount of work has to be done by way of logistics. And of course, uh, almost always we've had some issue to deal with uh, as a hearing uh, is either imminent or is proceeding, uh, whether it involves uh, the uh, advent of uh, a, uh, a pandemic or uh, an earthquake or whatever else has uh, struck us. On this occasion, we had to make some changed arrangements because of the uh, public holiday that was called at short notice, but as always, that was handled with aplomb and uh, efficiency. I want to express our appreciation to Law and Order for the work that they've done. As I remarked earlier today, we've had occasions where uh, witnesses and counsel and commissioners have been in uh, four separate uh, four separate locations and uh, it has all gone extremely uh, smoothly. Uh, no doubt that is partly attributable to the very long practice uh, that uh, law and order has had in doing these things effectively over a period of three years or so, but it's worked very well. And I also want to express our appreciation, of course, to the uh, interpreters who, as usual, did their outstanding job of uh, providing Auslan interpretation, uh, both for witnesses and for those who are following uh, the proceedings. And it's appropriate especially to recognise that because uh, of uh, this week's uh, recognition of the importance of Auslan interpretation, uh, which uh, Commissioner McEwen uh, acknowledged at the outset of uh, the uh, hearing. So thank you to everybody who have contributed to the uh, uh, this week. As I've said, it's uh, not the final day of the hearing, uh, and uh, we shall hear further evidence uh, on the uh, 6th of July. We'll adjourn until uh, at uh, 6th of uh, October. Did I say July? 6th of October. And so uh, although we... Uh, uh, I don't think there's any other hearing between now and then, isn't is there? So we'll adjourn until the 6th of October. Thank you. The Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability is now adjourned. Mm -hmm.